London Borough of Tower Hamlets, and also Vice Chair of the Association of Directors of Public Health in London. Professor Ewan Doyle, the Strategy Health Advisor to the Mayor of London and also Director of Public Health England, London. Thank you. And also to Melda Red Redmond, National Director of uh, Health Watch England, and also Peter Goldblatt, Institute of Health, Equal Health Equity, uh, University of London, um, University College of London. And of course, Amanda Coyle, Assistant Director of Health, Education and Youth at the Greater London Authority. Uh, so I'll start off asking the first question. If any of you want to f contribute or feel that I, I may, may have directed the question to some particular person, but if someone to contribute, please feel, to, feel to do so. Can I just ask, uh, Chair, in advance? I mean, um, Tom Coffey was, uh, was, was invited to this meeting, wasn't he? Or? Uh, yes, Tom Coffey got, why, why, wasn't why? invited. Why isn't, uh, why isn't he here? Yes. Um, uh, for the purpose of the health um, uh, and quality strategy, um, Professor Von Doyle was actually providing the strategic leadership to the health team, um, particularly on the health inequality strategy. So we um, discussed this and uh, we deemed it, it, um, it, it much more appropriate for Vaughan, who's been leading this piece of work, to speak. For Vaughan, who's been leading this piece of work, to be able to come and talk about what we've done over the last period. Um, we started our work on, 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 on health inequality before Tom Coffey was appointed. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. For, thank you for that. So the... Let me start um, asking this question, first of all, from you, Dr. Goldblatt. Um, what uh, are your overall, overall impressions of the strategy? What, what was your overall rule? feeling about the strategy? Um, I think it does an admirable job of combining um, addressing health outcomes and some of the what we would call downstream issues around health with a whole of London approach to addressing the causes of those inequalities um, and in particular recognizing the, the importance of good work, of um, early child development, and um, air quality and green spaces, many of the, the mayor's priorities. So I think that is the strength of the strategy. I think where I would have wished to see improvements is linking the different objectives in the strategy to both of those objectives. Many of the objectives, when, when it came down to the aim or the action that was being taken, was very focused on one particular area. The first two or three, first one or two, were very much focused on the downstream actions, when in fact early years, for example, needs to be considered um, in terms of children's overall skill development. If you achieve healthy children when they are seven or eight, that is very good, and they will learn better because of it. But if they don't have the cognitive skills that early years development is designed to achieve, then later in life they won't be able to live healthy lifestyles or get good jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be more cross-cutting objectives in each of the areas. The text is there, but it's when it comes to saying, this is what we'll do, these are the objectives in this area, some of them I found slightly narrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Banerjee? Uh, so I, I agree with what Peter said. I think this, the strategy covers a lot of the things that at local level um, we are grappling with and, and, and are the right things to be focusing on. Um, in relation to health inequalities. Um, I, I do kind of take on the point that at the moment, because this is a consultation document, some of the, some of the detail isn't, isn't there, but the direction of travel seems right. To me, it feels that what matters now is the quality of dialogue with Londoners, and particularly 
those Londoners in the most deprived parts of London. And I think that's what the opportunity that, that we have here. So if we get that consultation right, and it's a really good discussion, and we include a whole range of groups, I think this could be a really powerful strategy and a real opportunity to align what we're doing at local level um, across London. Thank you. And Imelda? Um, I, I think that from reading it, the uh, priorities seem like completely the right priorities. What's interesting, working for an organisation that covers the whole of England, that this is different than you would see in other parts of the country, and it feels appropriate for London, particularly with the, uh, with the younger population and the, uh, the growth in, um, in the numbers of children. So the, so the focus on young, children, on young people, on mental health, on the built environment, all seems absolutely right. I particularly welcomed the, uh, the, the language that was used around patient and public participation and engagement. I would agree with uh, my two colleagues, which was what, what would be nice to see is how you then embed that into your objectives so that it actually happens. And I think that's probably something that Healthwatch could help help craft because um, this work is actually happening in all communities in London right now and, uh, and I, th I think we could help embed that. So that would be my thing again about great ideas, let's embed them into, uh, into really quite tight objectives so that they happen. Great. And do you think, this is, this is again to Dr. Banerjee and to Dr. Um, Peter and to you Melba, are these strategic, strategic aims covered by the health inequalities and is there anything that's missing that you would, would, want, want them to, would, would have wanted to see then in, in, in the strategy? Peter? Okay. Uh, I think all the areas are mentioned, as I said, in the subtext. If you take the objectives in bold out of context of the text that sits below them, then I think there are gaps. Mm -hmm. In each, of, in each of the areas, I think some of the upstream actions that are needed in that area are missing. So what further action would be taken beyond what's already happening in <coughs> London to ensure good development at age two or three in children is the example I gave earlier. In mental health, there's a lot of emphasis on improving attitudes towards people with mental health. There's not an emphasis on preventing mental health problems in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, you can find some of that when you look at objective three, and, you talk, and it talks about good work, removing stress at work, and in other situations. But the gap is bringing those two objectives together so that seeing good work as a way of reducing mental health by reducing stress at work, just as a, an example. So, so I think it's going through all the objectives and looking at the cross linkages to make it a, a health in all policy, as the phrase goes. Um, yeah. And from our perspective, it resonates very much with what uh, local people have told Health Watch across London, their priorities being around real attention to mental health, um, uh, uh, some things around stigma and mental health, but access to services, I think, is a bigger issue. And I know that, that that's uh, a more complicated one, but, but the real thing that comes up around, particularly around mental health and social care, both really high priorities for the public, is accessing those services. And I think that, you know, something around inequality of access is a big issue. Uh, and and um, th there's probably some ideas again that have come up that we could share with you in, in drafting this. Yeah, Dr. Banerjee? Yeah, so, so once again, I, I, I agree with those things. I think that, you know, having read through the strategy, all the key issues are there. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, when you look at it the first time round, you don't, it doesn't all jump out at you. So, I mean, I'm, my borough town, Hamlets, has got the highest levels of child poverty in London, um, and that is the key driver for inequalities in, in outcomes um, for, for 0 to 5 year olds and children. And so that is all there, and that is really fundamental, and, and the narrative is there. I guess mm. it's just when you look at it the first time, it doesn't necessarily jump out at you. Yeah. Uh, this is for Yvonne and Amanda. Yvonne, 
Um, first of all, how is this strategy different from the strategies of the previous mayor? Um, well, Chair, it, this is the mayor's um, health commitments in his own manifesto seen through the lens of inequalities. That's what the intention was here. And his instruction to me and to the team here was to um, identify uh, how, how we could work with the, across the GLA to identify what everyone could do about health inequalities, accepting that what we do ourselves in public health would be fairly narrow in, in addressing some solutions to that. And his second instruction was to consider those priorities which are quite itemised in terms of fairness, you know, who, where does this uh, manifest most and to whom? So that's what we have set out to do. Okay, Amanda? Um, yeah, um, in terms of the differences between this and the, and, uh, and the, and the previous mayor's strategy, um, clearly um, this is a shorter term strategy. It's a 10 year strategy as distinct from the previous strategy, which is 20 years. Um, but I think more fundamentally, in terms of the differences, actually, this strategy tries to. Um, um, uh, very succinctly say like we, uh, what are the key aims um, and what are the key priorities that we should be um, uh, uh, focusing on as a city. Um, within the consultation period it is a very very much an active call to action from the entire system. So the, so it, so the document is, is designed um, uh, to be able to demonstrate system leadership but to be able to engage all of the partners across the city, both statutory businesses, um, the health service and so forth, to be able to come alongside us and really deliver and make a difference um, in terms of reducing health inequalities. Um, and that's what I would say is probably the difference between the two strategies. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask, uh, Ms. Coyle, um, the, how does the Mayor intend to generate buy-in for uh, this strategy from, from partners? Um, what happens if partners are unable to deliver what the mayor asks of them? Um, okay, so I would say actually, um, with this particular strategy and the way we've designed the consultation, um, we are actually going out to kind of you know uh, five key stakeholder groups, you know businesses, communities, the health service and, and providers, um, the children and youth sector, as well as local authorities to be able to have a partnership and collaborative conversation with them, um, to be able to actually say, you know, what are the type of pledges that you can actually come and, um, and, and, and come alongside the mayor to, to deliver? Um, and, and also, you know, what are the key measures that we collectively should be measuring our city um, in order to be able to demonstrate the impact of this particular strategy? Um, it feels like a very different conversation at, at, at the moment. Um, the way we're looking to govern the strategy is quite different. It's a system governance as distinct from, you know, a, a, a GLA kind of um, uh, direct and, and command type of uh, um, uh, governance. Um, so the consultation per se is, is a very, very important constituent part um, of how we are creating and co and co-creating this strategy with partners um, and we believe it's only through that co-creation and that alignment with, uh, with those partners um, will we be able to actually get a concrete set of actions to actually make um, a real and tangible difference. If Yvonne, I don't know whether you wanted to. Yes, you could. Yes, um, Mr. Both. So uh, this, is a, this is the key question in many ways because um, we in the profession can only deliver a very narrow band the GLA and across the GL, the deputy mayors and their strategies, and I, I know um, we'll come on to that, they can deliver much more in the upstream areas that, that uh, Peter has mentioned. But actually, we need London to buy into this, and it has to be a persuasion. We cannot command. I can't through Public Health England, nor can the GLA or indeed the mayor command partners. We can expect strongly from our closest partners, particularly the NHS and local government, uh, that they will be able to demonstrate their contribution to this, much of which is, as someone has said, good work already in progress, but what more can we do? And we're building on a firm foundation of good partnership for the past five years in, in that expectation. When we come to other sectors, the voluntary sector, um, business, and indeed to communities themselves, I think that will be very much a, a relationship in development 
And there, again, we would be hoping, and indeed the charitable sector, we would be hoping that the relationships we're already building will begin to expose and bring forward um, offers. But you know, it, it would be unfair, for instance, for us to expect communities to shoulder the burden of this while major partners were silent. So this is a very important element in the consultation. I, I, I get that, and, and um, you know, during the last mayor's uh, health strategy, I remember having a conversation with a borough leader who shall be unnamed, but basically that borough leader indicated that they'd signed up to this. Um, but when it came to deliverables, there were other more pressing things for them to do um, than concern themselves with the London-wide health strategy. Are there... Are there, are there action points that they will deliver on? Are there, is there a checklist or, or that kind of deliverable on this um, that, that, that will come from the strategy? I believe so, because what this strategy is doing is it's aligning what the Mayor has ambitions to do with what we know is also the ambition of local government and indeed um, perhaps in, in particular areas, the NHS, but particularly local government. I think that is where the relationship is strong. Uh, so we all want to see a reduction, for instance, in the instance of HIV. We want to see something done about TB and for, go further on that. We want every child to have the best start in life. I think the question is more about the relative contributions of each part of the system. And this means that no one part is expected to bear, bear the whole responsibility for this. Of course, the other side of that is that we do need to hold ourselves to account in ways that make sense to Londoners on, whom, on whose behalf we work. Okay, so, so there will be actually something that we can look at that from the health strategy that in, say, five years' time, we will be able to see progress towards a target. Is that... Is that the case? So one of the things we are consulting on in, the cons in this consultation is what exactly would be reasonable to measure as system measures. Um, we, as individual organisations, do have targets and we're expected to meet them. But together, where we're looking at the alignment of things we want to do together, we need to ask people what they reasonably will buy into and own. So there will be a set of indicators and we will measure them through Public Health England. So they must be measurable and we'll put past them through the right criteria for reality. Um, there will also be um, a delivery plan about what the, what the um, mayor and the GLA itself will commit to. And that will be, we will hold ourselves, I'm talking here as part of the GLA this time, to account for the delivery of that and there will be a governance structure around that. So there will be two forms of knowing what progress we're making. There's always a danger in this, and this is the London story, is that if you're going to come with, with the London lot-wide targets, um, that you, you only ever go at the pace of the slowest, uh, the, 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 the people that are the partner that's least willing to move forward. How, how do you address that? To some extent, this is an element of what is, where is the urgency, what is the priority. I mean, for children, for instance, we, we don't want to let this cohort of children down so that 10 years pass before anyone takes any action and a whole group of 10-year-olds have, have got even fatter, for instance. So, you know, there is an urgency about getting to grips with this for, for certain groups. In other circumstances, where we're dependent on some complex change, um, we, we need to perhaps take the pace slower, at the, particularly understanding who are the prime movers. If this were wholly dependent even on the other strategies of the GLA, I think we could expect a very brisk pace. If, on the other hand, we're depending on key partners to deliver some element of this, then we must be respectful of what they can do. If, um, if we have uh, feedback from communities that there are certain elements that they want, they would wish to see us progress further on, and others perhaps they need more support on, then we need to be respectful of that. So we need to take account of all of this. You, you, you mentioned communities, and how, how should the, the, the uh, 
mayor and partners approach that community engagement to, to, to know what it is that, that is required? I think the first thing is to understand what is there already, where there is a very vibrant interaction at community level, particularly with colleagues in local government with whom we work very closely. Um, and we've been able to build on that, for instance, in the Great Weight debate, where we, as a Healthy London partnership with the NHS, initiated a debate with, with parents, actually. But we then augmented that up to millions of responses through the relationship with local government, where there is already, um, there are many mechanisms for having that discussion. Um, obviously, one of the issues which I think Imelda is alluding to is how we can co-create the ownership of this strategy when it is published into something that we continue to work closely with communities on. And I think that will be very much a, a, a matter of understanding the current relationships and where we can support and develop new relationships that are needed. Thank you. Ms. Redmond, would you, what would you see as a, um, uh, an adequate consultation strategy with regard to communities' health? What should the mayor be doing? I think that there, there, with any strategy about community engagement, there have to be many, many strands to it. The first bit I'll, I'll just talk about is the, uh, the Health Watch part of it. Now, Health Watch is, uh, was set up as part of the 2012 um, health and care reforms and is in every London borough. So you already have, by statute, uh, an organisation that's there to listen to the voice and, and has their mechanisms into communities so that they can, uh, they can move things forward through established means. The, one of the, I think one of the outstanding things about many of the local health watch, particularly in London, well, across the country, but in London as well, is they have a, they have a really good focus on, on uh, groups of the community that are, f are, are furthest away from service and most excluded. So, so for an example, uh, Camden Health Watch has done a really great piece of work around the Bangladeshi community and working with the Bangladeshi community about how to, uh, how, how do they see co-creating improvements in their health, smoking cessation, obesity, um, uh, and, and how do they get engaged? And from that, flow to, flow has, has, has continued a piece of work where, the, where people in that community were being really clear about they wanted greater engagement. They wanted to do more themselves. They wanted to be ambassadors. They wanted to be people who could go and help other parts of their community. So there's that thing about seeing your community as assets, and I, I think that's, that's the great untapped thing that, that, that I think is there for us. In, in, in uh, Health Watch Hackney did a, a really great piece of work around um, sex workers and how they could access health and how they could get the support they need. Now they're not communities that people could, will necessarily find it easy to access but there are routes to doing that. So Health Watch is there to do it. I know also from my many years of working in the voluntary or in voluntary sector that um, every Every charity, or most charities, will have access to parts of their community. So they're representing people with stroke or multiple sclerosis, or uh, they're looking at, uh, at, um, at gang crime or uh, housing. They will have networks into their community. So it's using, it's using your community asset as a way of getting in, getting that information, but then not just saying what do you think, but also and how do you help? What's your part? What role do you play? What difference do you want to make? Uh, and I think that that's really, we've got to get much, much smarter about using the assets of our communities. I'm familiar with that uh, report from Hackney on sex workers. Yeah. It's very good. It's a good piece of work. And I hope that that does get effectively move up towards uh, contributing towards the overall strategy as well. Okay. Um, so, uh, that, that, what are we doing from the mayor's side to talk about engagement with disadvantaged uh, groups and how they can be engaged with? Uh, because we can't let, you know, Health Watch do it all. Um, what, what, what is the uh, mayor doing with regard to those particular communities? For example, Deaf Londoners. Yes, yeah, so um, in the creation of this um, consultation, we've, we've worked on this for over a year. We've had a steering group with 
um, a, a wide range of London assets, really, at the expert level, um, including from the Institute of he Health Equity, but also the King's Fund and, and academics and directors of public health. Um, we've also uh, had working groups with uh, groups that are uh, we find hard to outreach to, not that are hard to reach, but we find hard to reach. We've actually gone and discussed with those groups what they would find reasonable to include in this. So that, and we have um, our Talk London website, which is taking soundings regularly. Uh, but we know that's not enough and that we, this needs to be a good quality consultation where we will actually have bespoke sessions with groups um, and will in, really welcome anyone who invites us to discuss it as well. Uh, we've got several uh, ways into it electronically, but I think there is no substitute for face-to-face -face with groups who want to have that. So we will do that. I think, Mr Buff, it will be a continued... Um, dialogue with Londoners. It's something I have welcomed in our work before we set out to do this, is how much we do learn when we actually make the effort to go and find and talk to uh, people, and indeed Londoners themselves. We did it during the London Health Commission. It was instructive. We will continue to do it, and I think that would be part of our commitment, is to take the temperature and to make sure that we are finding the groups that um, we, we are purporting to represent in this strategy. So it must be a very long list of groups, of marginalised groups that you're trying to engage with, and it's very difficult when you make a list that you sometimes miss people uh, or, or miss groups out. How, how are you cross-checking that list of uh, difficult-to-reach communities? Um, yes. Uh, it's, uh, so we are working with the, the Mayor's Community Engagement Team um, so we're looking at it from uh, um, uh, from many different dimensions, both in terms of um, groups with protected characteristics, um, also groups we know um, which are particularly uh, mobile or vulnerable. So, um, for example, groups such as the Roman travellers, um, people, um, homelessness uh, uh, charities, and, and so forth. Um, we are also uh, looking at. Um, uh, um, talking with um, boroughs by the directors of public health in terms of their role, in terms of reaching out to communities, um, and, um, and and we've we made a generic call with um, a, 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 with some resources to local authorities um, for them to actually um, do some consultation on, on our behalf. Um, I think it's also fair to say that that um, that about halfway through the consultation, we will be taking a, a pause to reflect. Um, to uh, to examine um, the breadth and and, um, and the extensiveness of, of our reach, and to also um, to also uh, sort of cross uh, collaborate um, about um, areas where we know that there is um, certain issues that we want to go back to some of these communities to specifically talk to them about. Um, so I, I think at this stage um, we're very early in the in the, con in the consultation. And we've deliberately made the consultation longer than the statutory 90 days to, to allow us to have um, that time to reflect halfway through the consultation to make sure we're indeed getting the reach into those, um, into those groups and especially being able to, um, uh, to be able to access, access some of the voices which typically wouldn't engage with um, organisations like the GLA. I'm assuming that the senior health advisor will be at the fore, at the front of driving this strategy forward, is that correct? Uh, yeah, so um, so uh, it's, um, I think it's fair to say that both Yvonne, um, Tom Coffey and, um, and, uh, um, uh, and myself will be out actually talking to the various different sectors, be that businesses, communities, um, the children and, and, and young people sector, um, uh, local authorities, um, um, and using all of, the, um, all of the kind of regular meetings that we have already. Um, this strategy is one of the seven statutory strategies, so we actually are coordinating with some of the other strategies um, in terms of making sure that health is, um, is actually being taken into consideration in, in their strategies too, um, and trying to do that in the most intelligent and respectful way um, so that we can actually um, get access to the, to the most amount of Londoners that we can, um, we can talk with during this period. Um, uh, Dr Banerjee, um, how... Uh, what are the key challenges for the boroughs in, in 
delivering on this strategy? And, and would you say all the boroughs have bought into it? Uh, so um, I think it's kind of quite early. As a, a network of um, directors of public health across London, so ADPH, we are all engaged with it and we will work together to respond to the consultation. I think actually at, at the local level, uh, I think one of the key uh, the, the, the key issues is going to be the engagement of the health and well-being boards and I think directors of public health will have a really important role ensuring that health and well-being, working, building on what Amanda was saying, around ensuring that um, health and well-being boards are really engaged um, in responding to the consultation and because they have a lot of networks that we will need to get a really good response. Um, in terms of um, kind of what's been said already, I mean, we talked about the voluntary sector. I would also say that housing associations are a really important um, asset that, we'll, we, that we, we would use locally, for instance, in order to get some engagement around the strategy. Um, the other thing I'd say is that in terms of engaging people who don't normally engage in consultations, I think one approach that, that, that has been um, helpful locally is actually working with people in the community to get them to lead the consultation so we've had approaches in which we've actually trained people in the community within the community to take forward um, consultations to address questions which might be emerging out of the consultation so actually involving people in actually running the consultation may be a way of getting a really kind of rich uh, insight from from communities so we're not going to have a, re well, H how are the boroughs going to, isn't it difficult for a borough when they've got everything that they have on their plate to look at a London-wide st strategy and prioritise that over and above what their local strategy is? I mean, I think I'd say that, I, I think it's safe to say that um, across London, if you look at the health and wellbeing strategies at, at local authority level, there will be strong coherence with, with what's in, what's in the, um, the, May the London Mayor's strategy. So my thought is that uh, at the borough really? level... <laughs> this is, it's moved on then since I last looked at them because I found that the, when I looked at these strategies on the first few iterations after 2012 or whenever it was, Actually, there is a huge variation in uh, local priorities between different I think, priorities. I, I, I guess that um, it, 2012 was you know, quite some time ago. Yeah. In terms, of, since then, I think most boroughs will have will be on their refresh of the, oh, of right. the new strategies. So I they're coming together. Public health will be yeah embedded some yeah some of the issues that identified. I mean, they were vastly different. Oh, they yeah. I, I, mm. Like I mean. It, I mean, you're absolutely correct, um, but there are some key issues across the city. So, for example, childhood obesity yeah. um, would be something that you, you would see common to most of the strategies um, uh, within the whole area of um, uh, um, of health inequalities. Um, uh, children um, yeah. would be certainly an area that you see um, uh, common to most um, health and well-being strategies. Um, uh, uh, so. Um, uh, the other thing to mention is because we actually did quite a lot of consultation to come up with the priorities that we did, um, uh, we did actually talk um, uh, very collaboratively with uh, local authorities to be able to establish like what are the key things coming through their um, health and wellbeing strategies uh, to ensure that we get that alignment and that buy-in. That's encouraging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is to um, Amanda Yvonne. Which type of indicators will you be using to measure the success of the strategy, uh, and how are they being developed? Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Prince, there there are um, five areas in the strategy, and we have a technical um, group working on potential indicators for each of those. So what we want to do is we want to consult first about you know, what people feel we should be indicating in those areas. And we also have a suggested group, which we will put to our expert group, which is still standing, to really get um, 
you know, a feeling for whether how measurable and how real are these, and, and will they stand the test of time, and do they actually measure what is in the strategy? But we believe they do. So we already have about, uh, you know, about uh, 15, 16 indicators, which you would recognise, and some of them are actually already out there, but we want to make sure that they are adapted and they're absolutely right for London. So I don't think the indicators per se will be a huge challenge uh, because we're going to pick ones that we can, that they, they are, they, they pass the right technical criteria, they are updated regularly, they measure, they have validity, and they're in time, you know, they're not just measured every 10 years themselves. So, so that's where we are at the moment, but I think it's work in progress, I'd have to say. We do need to know what is, people are thinking. Uh, and the, these indicators, um, will they be able to monitor different characteristics, uh, sexuality, ethnicity and disability and so on? Yes, so that's one of the um, criteria that we'll be putting is can they be measured if place is important, you know, do we have the right measures of place in the indicator, Could, can it be done, and uh, by which groups, and some, some indicators are not measured at a, a level that gives you the kind of rich information you need to understand how inequalities are playing out. So that's what we'll be looking at. But those would be two key elements. Right. The other, of course, is age, which we've just mentioned. Yes, of course. And, and who, will, who will monitor the progress? Public Health England will provide the technical support to this. But actually, there's quite a lot of technical expertise in the GLA. And one of the ambitions of the strategy when it's final is that we, we pool these data and we begin to build a data store. Right. And, and that will go beyond indicators, actually. Right. It'll, it'll be much more about the area Peter was describing, about how we understand people's well-being and so on. Okay. Um, obviously, accepting that we've not had any detail, um, other members of the panel, uh, do you think there are any indicators that are an absolute must that, as far as you're aware, presently aren't in or haven't historically been in? Um, my, my, my only thought would be a, a, a robust indicator about well-being, um, which I, I think is, is kind of there. I, I think it, it would be really powerful if at, at all levels in London people were me measuring well-being in the same way or in a similar mm. way, but also in a way that you can break down meaningfully. So it's not just a population level, but you can look at it by different dimensions, um, such as the equality dimensions. So uh, it's in there, um, but actually if we could make that work for us better, I think that would be really good because it would help us with comparison, it would help us with pro monitoring progress. Uh, Professor, do you feel that's achievable, is that doable? Yes, it's, it's the holy grail is to understand what well-being actually means. And there are a number of measures, but I think it's the right area to be in. I mean, I think I accept what Peter has said, and indeed Shulman, that um, this may not be quite as topped and tailed as it needs to be in terms mm. of what we're trying to get at here. And it needs to be okay. very clear what we are actually um, understanding as progress, and well-being has to be in there. Okay. Um, thank you. That's very helpful. Do you right, mind yes, if please. I just said, I would like to see some measurement about uh, community engagement in the design delivery of things because if, if, you, if, you don't have, if you don't have something within the measurements then it falls off and it just becomes a statement of principle and, uh, and, and we know that people follow targets so um, I would like to see something that demonstrates yeah. that the community, community being, engagement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, properly engaged. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think I'd pick up on those points but go a little bit further and say that we're not going to achieve the holy grail in five years time. So in any inequality strategy you need indicators that measure um, process, outputs, outcomes and impact. These are fairly standard and so I think it's a matter of checking in each area that you have that those types of indicators. Mm. The second thing, I think, is because we've talked about good work and child development, it's also important to look at the other indicators that's being used by, 
by the GLA, by the mayor, to look at other measures of success mm. Mm. and to align. There's no advantage in having slightly different indicators for children to what children's services are mm. trying to achieve mm. or what the education services mm. are trying to achieve. So it's having a discussion with them about alignment of indicators. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Um, I have it. It's, it's been indicated to me that there has in the past been a lack of transparency regarding the activity of the London Health Board. Um, so how will you make this information available for wider scrutiny? And will the Mayor consider producing a dashboard of indicators to make this information more accessible? Um, so, um, uh, as Professor Dawes um, just mentioned, um, what's key in, in, in the consultation um, is that we're actually asking people uh, to uh, to contribute to the body of knowledge that we yeah. have uh, to be able to inform the indicators. Um, it's absolutely key that we actually have baseline um, air data so that we can track our progress over the time and we will be making um, those indicators um, wholly public and, and, um, um, and transparent um, because part of the strength of what we're trying to do is actually be able to feed back to the system about how we're doing and what progress we're making. Um, uh, um, so we can so we can continue to have um, a very active and, uh, and at least an annual dialogue in terms I in terms of that progress. Um, so yes, just to confirm, you, we mm. definitely will be making um, that indicator report uh, public. Thank you. Can I just, just confirm? Um, I mean, uh, are there any international comparisons for for uh, for, for, for uh, indicators of well-being? Right, because I mean, London wants to be the healthiest city in the world. Right. How do we compare ourselves with that, with other cities around the world? Yeah, so, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it is one of those um, a, a kind of evolving sciences, as far as I can see at, at the moment. Um, so we have done some work previously with Bloomberg um, in terms of, like, city challenges. Uh, we know that Bloomberg funded um, a whole project in Santa Monica to actually um, define wellness indicators for that particular city. Um, we've been looking at some of the indicators that, that other cities actually have been using, sort of uh, New York, Chicago, um, and some of the cities in, in the east as well. Um, uh, typically, the wellness type indicators tend to be quite survey based. Um, uh, but just to reinforce some of the, the comments of my colleagues, I, I think the skill has been able to triangulate um, some wider measures to be able to say actually, you know, which measures are proxy and which ones. Um, uh, actually, or are, um, are true, at, uh, you know, um, attitudinal um, uh, um, indicators. Uh, but my sense is that we is that in terms of wellness, we need to look at a basket of indicators and be able to track them over time. Uh, I, Yvonne, I don't know whether. You Yes, I agree. I mean, I think if we have an ambition to be the healthiest global city, and we do, we absolutely need to compare ourselves, you know, reasonably to what global cities are saying about their health. And we've looked into the comparability, and it's not very easy to do that across mm. some, because uh, for all sorts of reasons. But um, we've always been very close to watching what New York is doing, because a lot of their systems, strangely, are very similar to the public health system in London. Uh, so I think they're the ones to beat, really, all the time. Uh, and Bloomberg, of course, started um, the whole indication of public uh, scrutiny about public health there, because every year, um, New York made its indicators available to the public and it became a celebrated thing. You know, people wanted to know what we, that's where we want to be. Uh, we would like to have a whole suite of cities to um, measure with and there are various research projects that we're involved with which are looking into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question about the actual makeup of the board. Um, do, do you feel that it actually reflects the diversity and health of... Um, Partners across London. Is it it's, uh, are you referring to, to the London Health Board? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I would say at this point in time, um, we're pretty early on in in terms of um, in terms of, of the of the formation of this board. Um, this particular mayor um, uh, is, you know, was building out of a legacy of the board that was what, that was formed by Boris Johnson. Um, we have extended the, the membership of the board, um, so I think from a gender perspective, um, that is well balanced. Um, I think from a diversity perspective, um, then there's some progress we need to make. 
how you think it at the moment it, it fairly reflects the people that it serves do you um i think it, it's designed to actually um be able to solicit uh representation from some of the key organizations across london who have the greatest impact um on and, and resources to bear on um on the health of the uh, of the citizens here uh, and that's been initially the focus um uh, you know at the moment so so for example we have extended the board membership to include the trusts um so um uh, the board recently uh, um extended membership to claire murdoch uh, in terms of mental health and to Daniel Eccles in terms of uh, the provider side, um, to you know to represent the trusts. Okay. So, uh, are there community and voluntary organisations on, on the board? Um, at the moment, um, it is um, the board is constituted of local authority members plus health um, members at the moment. But are there any community and voluntary organisations on the board? At the moment, no. Uh, but quite a few of the board members do have. Huh? Uh, but um, at the moment, no. But quite a few of them of the board members do have uh, have trustee um, relationships with um, some of the charities. They may, have, they may have expertise, but they're not, there are no representation from the community and involved organisations. You're correct, yeah. Thank you. Do you think the board would benefit by having those organisations on the board? Uh, that's conversations that we haven't had at the, at the board at, at, at the moment, so um, I'm afraid I can't comment on that. Um, if the, you know, that decision is, 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 is for the chair to be able to determine. So, so, but the mayor could change, make some changes in here. Okay. Right, I would like to move on to um, health in all policies. Um, we'll start with Dr. Banerjee, um, but I also want to bring in uh, UCL and, and Health Board. The draft strategy says that health will be systematically considered in the development of mayoral policy. How will this really happen in practice? I think, I mean, I can comment at, at, a, at, a, at a local level. Um, I think one of the core purposes of public health in, in local authorities is to take forward this concept of health and all policy. So from our perspective, um, we are looking at the, the, the key strategies within um, local authorities and how you ensure that health is central to those, um, which, is, which is quite a challenge. Um, uh, but it relies on us working well across the council. So, for instance, in terms of planning, um, I mean, in the borough that I work in, in Tower Hamlets, it's one of the fastest growing populations in London, mm. and that creates a lot of um, challenges around how that pace of growth um, also takes into account health and well-being. So a real priority, which is, in, which is within our health and well-being strategy locally, is embedding health impact assessment into uh, planning developments um, in Tower Hamlets. And so those are the sorts of things that, that we are trying to take forward um, locally. Similarly, in terms of the employment strategy, integrating the development of um, uh, employment programs with, with the health service and linking that to mental health and learning disabilities. All of those things are things that we are trying to do locally and it's really welcome that actually if that can also be championed at a London level it gives us locally a real lever to drive those things forward uh, which are not easy things to do. Um, Health what do you have any comments on that? Well, well, from, from the public's point of view it just makes perfect sense because uh, people don't live in boxes that say I'm now thinking about health I'm now thinking about housing I'm now thinking about transport I'm now thinking yeah. about early years uh, so any gains you get in improvement in people's health and well-being whilst delivering on other strategies makes perfect sense. It, I can't see why you wouldn't. <coughs> Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think one of the first things to do is to try your very best to align the goals with other sectors mm. so that you have a single face towards the community and the public that you say yes, the mayor is working for um, giving children the best start in life. The mayor is working for good work in, in London and, uh, and identifying the health component of that rather than saying it's a health-driven goal. Um, so I think 
part of it, I, I would say, in, in looking at the, the document itself, is to look how many references to health or healthy you could remove from this document, and it would still say the same thing, so that it is speaking to a wider audience. Um, I think, and just to build on what Showman was saying, I think it's also important not just to do health impact assessments, but health equity impact assessments, which is around looking at the equity elements of any policy, as well as the health elements and how they interrelate. So that's good. That brings a very nice segue into my next question, actually, which is uh, to what extent does the success of the strategy depend on reducing income inequality across London? Yes, I mean, I, I would say that that was an important element um, in our own recommendations in 2010. We recommended a minim that there should be a minimum income for healthy living, which is slightly different from a minimum wage or a London living wage. It's also about the total amount people have, and in London, housing costs are a particular mm. issue in relation <coughs> to people not having enough to live healthily. So does, the Lon does the London living wage help at all, do you think? It, it certainly helps because that's one thing that can be done here, but you need to take into account the, the amount of benefits that people are able to access and the debate around housing benefits because of housing being such an issue. Um, so I think in, in answering your question, achieving that level of, of health, yeah. healthy uh, income within London is central to health. I think after that, other health inequalities beyond that, I would say are less important, but I know other people would disagree with me. Okay. Does anyone else want to come in on that? If not, I know my, yes. I mean, my colleagues come in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Member um, Prince, for letting me in. Because um, I know you've got some more questions in this section. Dr. Banerjee, can I actually invite you to give your observations for this whole issue of income inequality, particularly in light of what you said earlier, that Tower Hamlets, which I represent the Assembly, although here we could take a Londoner perspective, I appreciate that, um, has the highest level of child poverty in London. There's also that often quoted statistic about every stop that you waste was on the Jubilee line. Your life expectancy goes down. Um, so, I mean, I would really be interested to hear your views. About, I mean, you talked about linking employment and planning processes with health, but particularly issues of uh, income inequality and, and class. Uh, coming, from, I mean, uh, coming where you come from, I, uh, in terms of Tower Hamlets. I mean, I, mean, I guess, um, I mean, the first thing to say is that this is a strategy, this, the London Mayor's strategy is a strategy which is right at the heart of, you know, inequalities in London and, ta and in Tower Hamlets is kind of the kind of area that needs to be really impacted on by this strategy. Um, and clearly, you know, we have, I mean, as, as, as was set out when the strategy was launched, um, we have uh, amongst the highest levels of well, oh, sorry, the lowest levels of um, healthy life expectancy in, in London. So people in Tower Hamlets, um, because of the, you know, the wider determinants of health, income, um, education, housing, the physical environment, all of those issues, so all of those contribute to people in Tower Hamlets getting um, unwell and being in poor health earlier in life. Um, you know, as a local authority, there are things that we can do. There are things that we can influence to impact on, on, on those health inequalities, but we can't do that on our own. Um, we, it, it's also dependent on what happens nationally and also what happens um, at London level. Uh, so, for example, if you take one of the issues that really affects and worries people in, in Tower Hamlets, it's some um, air pollution. Uh, mm. We did our... Um, consultation on the health and well-being strategy and I actually was quite surprised that actually one of the key issues that emerged as an issue of concern um, was was air pollution and so there are things that we can do locally to mitigate the impacts of of air pollution there's things that can be done at London level and there's things that can be done sort of nationally and I guess 
uh, you know, working in a borough like Tower Hamlets, you have to do what you can to, in some senses, mitigate the impacts of deprivation. So we're talking about um, poverty, people in crisis, people on f food, you know, going to food banks, and actually people right on the edge. Um, if we are really organised in what we do in terms of our local anti-poverty strategy, which we're developing in Tower Hamlets, we can have we can play our part in that actually by really identifying the people um, who are approaching crisis and providing support. Um, but at the same time, there's a there's a lot more that 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 needs to be done at London level and national level. So so that's our challenge. Um, at a local level, but as, as, as I've said, this strategy can only help us if it really um, in, helps, if, 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 if um, we can really sort of engage with it and it kind of actually provides, um, in terms of what, the, what it says about the mayor's role, about the, the mayor's strategies itself, the championing, and actually some of the, some of the programs that are, are, are coming through, such as the, Th the Thrive program, um, the, the Children's Digital Hub, which is a kind of electronic red book. Those are things that actually could really help us. Thank you. I just want to sort of clarify some of the terminology uh, with uh, Mr. Goldblatt. If the, if the rich were poorer, would the poor be healthier? Not necessarily. Um, because of the way that the economy works. If, if so the rich yeah, were poorer, so they, you may not have such a vibrant economy. And so, I, in the same way as the, the anti-poverty strategy in Tower Hamlets and other, el elsewhere, yeah. bringing people out of the risk of poverty. I think another element that we, just in that discussion, that we forget about is the element of wealth and debt. And whereas the, the bottom 20% are largely in debt, the top 20% are obviously very wealthy. And debt counselling is something that you can build into a, an anti-poverty strategy at a very local level. So that is something that can be done within I'm absolutely London. encouraged by what you said and, and your earlier contribution as well, but it's framed in the context of a question about income inequality. Mm -hmm. And absolutely we have to attack poverty. Um, but the whole inequality thing is something that worries me. Is if we focus just on the gap that we won't appeal, that we won't address the poverty, which is yeah. the real uh, source of, mm. of, of health uh, problems. Yeah. Well, I... I think, as Shoman was saying, it's also about people who are at risk of poverty. And when you talk about that, you're really talking about 40% of the population, rather than the 20-odd percent who are actually in poverty now. There's another 20% who are finding it very hard to manage and are at risk of poverty. The ones who are a few weeks, a few paychecks away. From That's right, or are managing through debt and once that debt gets out of control, they're into poverty. So I think <coughs> when I talk about that, I'm talking about perhaps 40% of the population Absolutely. being in a, but in a better just, place. You'll understand the terminology is a different yes. thing. One is about attacking poverty and the other one is about attacking income inequality. And, and I think one's a red herring and the other is absolutely yeah. a genuine battle. Yeah, but we need to take a wider view of attacking poverty than simply people who are on, the, on or below the bread line. Yeah. That's the idea of the minimum income for healthy living. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so um, this is... Uh, to Mrs. Doyle and Coyle, I can put it like that. Um, what level of input from the health team, Public Health England, and from the Mayor's statutory and political advisors on health, which I do, has been given to the team to develop the other st statutory strategies, and at what stage of development are they? So I can answer for, for myself and for Public Health England here. So um, in the role of a statutory advisor, I set out at the beginning of this, alongside having the um, expert group, to meet all the deputy mayors, because right. in this new term, uh, all the strategies were being refreshed, and we felt this was an opportunity, mm. as Peter says, to have health imbued without the words health in there. 
And we found open doors everywhere. People were, were very amenable to this discussion. Um, like, I mean, it was very similar to how we would work with local government or partners. The idea was, you know, how could we align what we were trying to do together? And there's a surprising amount of overlap mm. in environment, culture, economics. You know, where mm. is it that we have the, the um, areas where we both want to achieve the same thing for the population? And then how could we go further? How can we support through the health side, not, all, not entirely in the inequality strategy, but just in a general relationship? How can we support those deputy mayor's work? And how could they consider health in their work? So we've made our way around uh, pretty well everyone. We still have one or two to meet, but the door is open. And their strategies are still to be published. Um, so I think you, there would be a surprising amount of um, con, con, uh, um, consistency. And actually, we found this out uh, yesterday. We were uh, meeting some of the designers who are going to get involved with good growth in London to help mm. us get good standards. And each of the deputy mayors and myself gave a pitch, really, as to what we wanted to achieve. And we, uh, after a while, we were repeating each other which was reassuring. Mm. And it was good for the designers because they weren't getting confused. Yeah. So I think we're, we're getting there. Okay, that's good. So um, what ongoing support are you able to offer these deputy mayors and the other GLA family uh, to ensure that health remains you know, top of the agenda? Uh, and do you have, the, do you have a, the right team? Do you have the capacity to provide that level of support? Yes, yeah, so an example of this, um, of what support we can offer, is in the environment strategy, there's an ambition to improve air quality, which is very much a health ambition yeah. as well. Um, <clears throat> we will work through Public Health England with the monitoring of uh, the particular ambition around schools. We do this anyway, we'll be doing air quality in London at any rate. But we make sure we align very carefully uh, with the internal team here on air quality plus the additional measures that may be needed and expertise about you know, how do we actually model what's going on around schools. Uh, and that plays to um, Showman's point about structural disadvantage where schools in poor areas are experiencing poor air quality and the parents are worried about it. Mm. So we'll work together closely on that. We'll provide the technical assistance, but we'll also provide the open door for what else we can do and with, wi with which partners we could do that. Yeah. On obesity, equally with the food strategy, we're working very closely with the food lead on this and how we can work perhaps with businesses mm -hmm. to understand how we can encourage a healthy business market. Sure. Good. Oh, um, thank you. That's very helpful. It's probably also worth... Um, uh, mentioning that the health team were involved um, in designing the integrated impact assessments which have been used and applied to all of the statutory strategies um, and also um, we do actually have some dedicated um, public health expertise embedded um, in, in some parts of the organisation for example um, within, the, within TFL um, we um, have a public health expertise embedded in uh, um, and actually they've been working with TFL for the last couple of years um, and I think um, we're seeing some really, really good success as a result of that in terms of, um, in terms of this mayoralty adopting a healthy streets approach. Um, you'll see um, as, all the, all, as all of the statutory strategies um, um, are published um, that uh, there is um, a, um, a very clear health element in all of them. Um, the next strategy um, that will that will be published will be the London plan um, and clearly um, with such an important strategy um, we have actually had public health um, expertise embedded within that team um, and you'll see coming through that strategy that that health is actually um, um, uh, coming through not only in terms of, of healthcare service provision but also as a cross-cutting um, theme across that entire strategy. Um, but we have been um, 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 actively involved with all the other teams in terms of the seven strategy strategies. Um, and indeed, those teams um, have been in active dialogue with us in terms of, um, uh, of actually contributing to our um, health inequality strategy. So things like um, uh, the impact of, um, of, of the economy and so forth. Um, that particular team have been involved um, um, in, 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 the, um, in the review of our strategy too. Thank you. Thank you. You wish? 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving on, um, I've got uh, a question, specific question of you, uh, Dr. Banerjee, um, uh, Mr. Goldblatt, and um, uh, Ms. Redmond, uh, then, and then some specific questions to you, Ms. Doyle and uh, Ms. Coyle. But, um, the first question, really, the three of you, uh, Dr. Banerjee, Mr. Goldblatt, and Ms. Redmond, what is your vision of a good, healthy, early years program uh, for London. What do you think you should include? I can, I can start. Um, um, I, I, I think, obviously, what, one, one of the key things, and I think it's mentioned in, in the strategy, is the importance of um, emotional attachment. From is what, so emotional? Emotional attachment and p parenting skills um, and um, ensuring that actually children feel secure in their early years and, um, and feel loved because those are the things that are actually really important for future emotional well-being. I think one of the key things locally is, is actually the integration of early year services. Um, so we have health visiting services, we have children centres, um, we have um, employment services and actually so the key thing uh, that local services need to achieve um, is the support of, of young families. So that will be around health needs, but also around issues around employment and housing and those sorts of issues, and for them to get that support early on. Um, so that actually a child, the children, uh, in early years, children are able to um, be brought up as far as possible in really secure environments because that's the thing that's really going to make a difference to their health and well-being in the longer term. I mean, I would, I would echo all of those things. Children who are brought up in poverty are, suffer many disadvantages, particularly because their parents are stressed and therefore um, some of the core loving uh, and attachment issues. So when we looked at it, um, we found that what you, the most effective programs in early years were those that combined parenting with work with the child. So it's helping both the children and, in parallel, the parents. I think the other element of it is the first thousand days are recognised as being terribly important. So the early year strategy shouldn't just begin at age three. You, it needs to begin at or even before conception and go through for the first um, few months of the child's life in terms of um, the child being brought up in a, with a healthy mother and a healthy environment and I think that the strategy mentions breastfeeding as important. Um, but then to have early year provision, because that is one of the ways in which you can address some of the challenges that children in poor homes face or children who are in other ways disadvantaged or lacking support and in the homes. And it is all about social, emotional and cognitive development. And the aim of that, which I think again is recognised in the strategy, is having children who are ready for school and you can talk to teachers and they have a very clear idea of what constitutes children who are ready for school and which children have not come ready for school. The international evidence is that children who attend earlier facilities leave school at age 15 with better maths and reading abilities than those that did not. And there is a socio-economic dimension mm -hmm. to that. So all of those elements are important. Can I just, uh, just add one thing to that. I think uh, another thing that's really important is the easy availability of really good play areas um, for 0 to 5, you know, so green spaces, mm -hmm. really good play areas but also the perceptions that it's safe to use those areas. So obviously in, in areas of, of deprivation, people you know, have worries about antisocial behavior and kind of their personal safety. So that can be a, a barrier to the use of services, even if they are high quality. So, because active play is something that's really important, particularly if you're thinking you know, in terms of 
you know, levels of obesity that we find at the age of five. So I think we, the environmental elements are also really important. And these are actually obviously mentioned quite a lot in the London Mayor's strategy. And, and that can tie in also with air pollution because making the streets safer um, by making residential areas less polluted um, and, and say at the same time safer also addresses obesity because children are more active. Um, I, I would say, I have to say, uh, through Health Watch, a lot of a lot of the work is around um, working with young people on how to make uh, build their resilience and um, and improve mental health, and that tends to be a theme that comes through very strongly. But from other work that I've done. I think, the, 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 as colleagues have said, the issue around pregnancy support is critical. The first thousand days, absolutely critical. The attachment that children can form. And, um, so uh, things around perinatal um, mental health, critical. There's some really excellent work done by the first thousand day um, organisation and also the Early Intervention Foundation who have done all the research into this and know how to do it. We have, a, we have an odd um, uh, policy around childcare in, in, across the country, which is that you can only start accessing quality childcare when your child is two. And then you can start accessing free uh, education. If you have the money, then you can buy it from earlier. And some children can get some free childcare. But you can only get your 30 hours when the child is two and parents are in work. So, there is, so I think you're disadvantaging the, the, the very families who are on the lowest income, who need, the, um, who need most support. Uh, again, from previous work, the, uh, the issues around instability of income, that fluctuating income that so many families have, and the insecurity of housing, the idea that you don't have a home that's your own, that after six months you might need to move on, causes a huge amount of distress in families and just simply doesn't give them the opportunity to focus on all those nicer things that we would like to focus on. Um, I, I would say that the um, early years play is critical, but it doesn't stop when a child enters school. We need play to go right the way up and we need good facilities for youth uh, for young people so that, so, that, so that they feel like they're part of a community that holds them and then the, and they give back at the right time. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, it has to be very rounded. It has to be pre-birth through to their over 18 into the early 20s. Thank you. Um, if we could come now to you, uh, Professor Doyle and Ms. Cole. Um, a couple of questions. How do you see the mayor monitoring uptake uh, to make sure that his children greatest uh, need uh, who are reached? And how do you see the children being identified? So um, I can uh, start that really. Um, so uh, the mayor uh, at the moment, um, the previous mayor commenced this, but actually this has been strengthened, has a healthy schools program where um, almost 2,000 of the schools in London, and, and that's the vast majority are engaging with this program. Um, this mayor has, has taken the message about the importance of extending that back towards birth um, and is looking at having um, 18,000 uh, childcare facilities in London engage in a, an early years, healthy early years program, which would be looking at a number of the um, m uh, measures that were mentioned here about what constitutes good child development working with parents. Unfortunately, it doesn't go to birth. It does start at the time when the, the children go into child care facilities. Uh, but it is a, a significant development. And we are now trying to work through how we target that so that we start that in the areas where the highest deprivation exists. But we don't have is an understanding of where individual families and children are. I think to do this we would be working very closely um, with other partners if we were going down that route. But I think what we're looking at across the city here is big programs that actually will put a, a significant amount of resource and emphasis on these early years. 
And just to add to that, um, uh, with respect to the early years programme, um, we are actually in pilot stage at the moment of that. Uh, we're working with six London boroughs, um, and we have recruited um, a substantial number of early year settings. And now what we're doing is actually working with the local authorities to actually test um, e the model. Um, the model is actually predicated um, on, um, on working with the local authorities who of course have, have the statutory responsibilities in terms of uh, childcare um, 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 and actually to really think about how we target that program um, at the areas of most disadvantage mm. so that we can look to actually engage those families um, uh, who actually um, are living in the most disadvantage. Um, so key to that um, is our relationship um, and working up that program with the local authorities. Um, and just one small note of correction, that's 12,000 um, uh, childcare providers rather than 18,000. Um, uh, and that's the information we've got from um, Ofsted. You talked about the pilot schemes. Um, when will the evaluation of, this, of the pilot schemes be completed? And will these evaluations be made publicly available? Uh, so we are proposing to evaluate um, the early years pilot after year one. Um, and yes, we can make that evaluation public. All right. um, and just one final question. Um, what percentage of early year settings do you see the mayor reaching by the end of his mayoral term? So, uh, so that's the piece of analysis that we're doing at the moment. Um, we, we had to start from the point of view in terms of actually determining how many early years uh, childcare providers there are. Um, uh, that, of course, it, um, is a moving feast. Um, a, a majority of the childcare providers here in the city are, are privately run businesses, so they, you know, the number will fluctuate. Um, we know that Ofsted has a role in terms of actually uh, um, assessing uh, the quality of child care providers. So um, we are talking with Ofsted in terms of actually a partnership with them. Um, we are actually trying to um, uh, explore with the local authorities what is the, bec the best mechanism to engage those businesses um, and indeed the, the local authority run child care um, providers. Um, and we would anticipate um, within the final strategy being able to actually um, say uh, exactly how many um, uh, childcare organisations we will target over the, over the mayoral term. Uh, but at the moment we simply don't have as much information as we need to be able to set that uh, um, uh, target at the moment. But we'll be able to get back to this community once yeah. we have that yeah. information, yeah. either yeah. through correspondence with officers. Mm. Yeah, I think absolutely. it's good to have yeah. output figures and yeah. You know, where we are, the direction of travel, where we are going in terms of concrete, yeah. uh, uh, concrete outputs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Andrew? Thank you. Um, the Mayor had some good words in his manifesto about mental health um, and uh, ones that we could all support. What specific action has the Mayor undertaken to date uh, through the Health Board or you know, otherwise? Uh, to advocate for London as proper access to mental health services, which is one of his commitments. Uh, so, um, I would say, um, actually, probably most excitingly in terms of, um, of the Mayor's commitment in this area, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, mental health was the first thing that he made an announcement um, uh, about when he was um, first elected in terms of his, his statements in and around Mental Health uh, Week. Um, we have been um, uh, working across the system um, on a very significant program, uh, Thrive London, um, and the London Health Board, of course, which he chairs, um, has actually taken that on board, and we made the announcement uh, and, and, um, and the launch of that in July. Um, that, was the, uh, uh, that was the start of a, of a conversation with Londoners um, in and around um, tackling discrimination, uh, mental health with respect to, to younger people uh, um, in terms of communities and their role in, 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 um, in, in reducing mental health. Um, it's probably worth uh, noting that actually the Mayor's um, role predominantly is, um, and, and indeed that of Thrive, is, um, is around actually uh, preventing mental illness um, and actually producing communities which are supportive of good mental health. Um, and, um, um, and the board itself actually works across with the NHS um, in terms of actually improving uh, mental health services across the city. Um, 
We heard uh, during our investigations into mental health that some communities suffer particularly badly from accepting uh, those with mental health issues. Um, will the Mayor be brave enough to approach those communities uh, with, with, a, with a message that more needs to be done? Yeah, so, um, uh, so you're absolutely right um, um, in terms of actually the prevalence of mental health and, uh, and we see that um, you know, certainly among certain communities. Uh, certainly within BAME communities, um, it's, it's, um, the rate of mental illness is, um, is, is disproportionate. Um, some of the really encouraging things we're seeing coming through Thrive um, um, are programmes like Black Thrive in, in Lambeth, um, and they're specific programmes actually to address um, uh, issues within certain um, parts of our population. Um, Thrive, um, in terms of its conception, um, is a whole system approach to actually tackling mental health across uh, the city. Um, it's early days yet, um, but what we're seeing is some really encouraging signs, both in terms of community activity, both in terms of, um, of local authorities actually launching their own um, programmes, such as Thrive Greenwich, um, and also some, um, some really innovative ways that schools are looking at actually um, addressing mental health. Um, so, as I say, it's pretty early days with um, uh, Thrive London um, and, uh, and the Mayor, through his sponsorship um, uh, and the leadership through the board, will be um, uh, um, continuously um, reporting in terms of how we're doing um, uh, against that programme. Um, and Vaughan, I wonder, did you want to add to that? Yes, I mean, the other area where we, we're very keen to make progress is with, with the workforce and with business um, and employers. And uh, there's a huge push now on getting people to talk to each other about mental health, but they don't feel confident in that. So there's a, a large um, investment by a lot of employers now, including ourselves and the GLA in mental health first aid, so that people actually feel kitted to make those first connections. And that does have significant um, impact further on on the sometimes tragic circumstances where people are thinking about suicide and you know, that contact with somebody can actually offset a suicide. Um, it, it isn't, it, it isn't a, a recipe for all suicide, but it's very important people feel they have that confidence. How many have received that uh, mental health first training? Uh, sorry, uh, mental, yeah, first aid training. Uh, so today. we're going through it at the moment, uh, Mr. Boff. Our organisation is, um, the GLA is the mayor and his top team have gone through it. Um, and we are working with the city, the city Mental Health Alliance, where um, that has been uh, something that businesses have wanted to take on. Uh, but we have some way to go. I mean, we really, the, the, between that and the Healthy Workplace Charter, we're still really only beginning to touch the surface of all business, so many of which, of course, are small and medium enterprises. Would it, would it be a good idea to establish a target for that? Because it's immeasurable, and in mental health, there's, it's, it's often quite difficult to get measurable. Um, yes. So uh, that yes. at least would be something we know we could have achieved if we can get a certain number of people trained in London. Yes, and we, uh, whether we can set a target for business, I'm not sure, but we will certainly know through our connections and networks how many people have gone through this because we're very close to the organisation that actually leads this uh, development. Um, so we will know how, what progress we're making, and I think it's not unreasonable to ask the public sector to uh, account for that and, and yeah. make uh, I mean, so, progress. So you, you would aim to spread that to, say, lo local authorities doing... Uh, Mental, mental health first aid, as well as company uh, enterprises as well. Yes, very much so. And actually, we found local government has, has embraced the Healthy Workplace Charter across London. I think most the majority of boroughs have actually undertaken it. We've had perhaps a little bit more difficulty with some of the other public sector organisations. Anything but we'll get uh, there. from the police? Could they... Some yes, the police, the police as well. Could really do with this. <laughs> Very much so, and that's one of our um, ambitions: is to get the police. Uh, and we are, we have been in touch with the new regime in the Met, Met and very receptive to a change of um, orientation. I, I, yeah. I think the committee. Uh, I can't speak for all the committee, but I'm sure that we would welcome some firming up on numbers. Mm. Yes. There, some idea yes. of mm. what's a good number to try and aim to achieve. Yes. I mean, there's one target that we know that we're not going to achieve, and um, if, you know, 
zero suicide city. I sometimes wonder whether or not that's a good target, but I've, I've supported a letter going from this committee to use that terminology, but it's not really a target. That's never going to happen. Should there be one in terms of suicide reduction? My view is there should be. Um, we've set, it's the outside of this um, strategy, uh, in our work, we've set uh, very uh, firm ambitions. And the Healthiest Global City, the Better Health for London, set um, ambitions to reduce um, uh, the prevalence of various problems and upstream issues. So I think it's a good ambition. I, I agree with you. I think it's highly challenging. Uh, and so suicide fluctuates for so many reasons um, that you can attribute it to your work and actually, you know, you, you need to be very humble about what you are actually achieving in relation to suicide. However, we do know that there is much more we can do in relation to suicide and mental health in general than we are doing. So I think it's, it's the right thing to put out there so that people know that we're ambitious. If I could ask Ms. Redmond, what do you think we should be doing to ensure that Thrive London is targeted at the communities where there are greatest, the greatest inequalities? One of the great things about oh, Thrive... Sorry, in the greatest need. I'm using my, <laughs> making my own mistake there. Um, sorry, <laughs> uh, where there's greatest need. Okay. One, of, one of the great things about Thrive is that it came through um, the black community in Lambeth to start with. So that's its roots. So uh, I think remembering where it's come from and what its purpose is, uh, uh, Th Thrive um, in Lambeth is actually housed within Lambeth Health Watch. And, and so spreading that learning across the, across the city, I think, is really important. But I, it, I think the thing is, um, th these initiatives need proper support, but they don't need to be taken over. They need proper holding and proper resourcing but they, they need to allow the communities to develop them and to provide support for each other and development for each other. So it's, it's quite a difficult balance, but at the same time they do, they need support, but um, it'll work in a very different way from a, a statutory bureaucratic organisation about how they get to their end point. So yeah, don't lose, don't lose sight of your roots is what I'd say. And Mr. Golga, how do you think we're going to get to the <coughs> right? Well, <coughs> I, think, I think the community approach is important because one of the key elements in both suicides and other aspects of health is social isolation. And there are a lot of, although London is a very vibrant city, there are large numbers of people who do feel socially isolated, who who aren't made, able to make those connections and having communities then which work bottom up and use their resilience and their resources to support others in the community is important but there will also be people who are not linked to, to specific communities and that requires uh, different types of action to engage them as I said earlier um, issues arising out of stress at work and long working hours also um, lead people into a, a bad place where they contemplate suicide. But, but So you need to address it on all aspects of people's work and social lives. And, and there are specific issues with young people uh, because some of the highest suicide rates are among young people, or certainly the largest proportion of deaths from, are from suicides among young people. So it's a significant issue among young people as well. Can, can I just, just add as well that I think one of the ironies at the moment is uh, at a time where we, we know that we know the interventions that can work and, we, and we, we want to do the upstream prevention. It's the same time where quite a lot of the low-level community support that holds things together is disappearing. And I think that's a, that, for me, is a real worry. You see that around London. You see it around the country as well. The, the things that just, you know, that bring people together, that create community, that, uh, that have that sort of peer-to-peer -peer support in, a, in, a, you know, in quite a light-touch way 
but they do need support. They need to be tied into something bigger than them. It doesn't just happen organically. Uh, we, we're seeing that disappearing, and that's really very worrying because you can't do the prevention, the suicide prevention, unless you're doing the low-level uh, meet in a cafe, uh, get quality information, make sure people are signed up with GPs, and that's going. So can I just add, add to that? Because um, uh, I, th I think I, th I think you're right. It's, it's actually sometimes very small things in people's lives that can make a big difference. It's, it's one of the things when we work very closely with communities. I'll just give you an example. Um, there was a, an elderly woman who was very socially isolated, living on her own. Um, the reason why she wasn't going out was because her house wasn't secure. Uh, once her house was secured, she started going. We, we helped to go to you know, the, um, the local centres, the, the Linkage Plus Centre, and she suddenly developed you know, a, a lot of social contacts, went out regularly. But it was just a very small thing that you yeah. couldn't necessarily identify through some sort of policy or strategy. And I think those are, it's identifying those like, really small things in people's lives that could make a big difference that are going to be really important. And I think that's why I think that community engagement um, that is really being stressed in Thrive is really important. So I kind of... I think it's important to make that point. That community um, engagement um, is obviously something that the Mayor is also looking at doing something about. Um, beyond, um, uh, you know, what direct action can the Mayor take to, to boost, for example, social prescribing? Uh, will the mayor commit, for example, to using GLA group, uh, GLA group land and building assets to provide the premises needed for community organisations that can do what Ms. Uh, Redmond's indicated, provide that, those social links? Um, uh, uh, so, um, so within the health inequality strategies, um, one of the clear um, uh, programmes that we have identified is, um, is social prescribing. Um, and the pieces of work we're doing at the moment um, are really starting um, um, with, um, uh, to work with uh, the local authorities, plus the health service, plus the voluntary sector, to be able to establish um, um, some of the current schemes which are, are already uh, working out there already, um, of which there are 20 of them. Um, and actually been able to understand um, what are the component parts of those um, uh, established um, uh, good models um, which we need to build out from. Um, we need to actually, um, actually uh, approach this um, from an asset-based um, uh, mentality because we know that there are a lot of assets within communities um, that uh, we need to be able to kind of network together. Um, so. Um, we are at the start of our journey in terms of, uh, of actually understanding uh, what would be the regional role in terms of supporting uh, uh, local authorities to be able to do that. We, uh, we recognise that delivery um, of social prescribing will always be done locally. Um, we recognise that um, there are schemes where, uh, where the local authorities have been really successfully able to do that. Um, and we need to be able to share the expertise from, uh, from certain boroughs um, and more widely across um, the rest of the London boroughs. Um, so we're coming from really a point of humility in terms of actually um, understanding um, uh, where, the, um, uh, where, uh, where NHS England and where um, primary care I really want to be able to actually um, increase social prescribing, um, but we recognise that um, <coughs> you know, the key to social prescribing um, is, the, is, is civil society, um, are, the, are the local um, voluntary organisations um, um, who need to be um, um, uh, connected and supported, and um, 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 excuse me, and also working with local authorities to ensure um, that they are at the heart of that co-creation. Um, so that the local authorities can actually create schemes, you know, which are actually relevant to the communities that uh, we're trying to um, provide those services for. G GPs Showman, need to be involved in this as well. Big one. GPs probably need to be involved yeah. in this as well, don't they? Quite closely. Um, yeah. So we're working with healthy, um, healthy London partnerships, um, uh, who have been working on on, on some social prescribing um, uh, projects with the 
uh, clinical commissioning groups um, uh, in terms of actually being able to marry up what the, what the GP um, element of it is with the civil society element, with the London borough element of it as well. I mean, you, you talk about the assets, but the mayor, you know, in the health strategy itself, it goes on about line of fire service assets. We've got some more assets probably coming up in police stations. Um, are they all going to be considered as uh, potential community hubs? Yes, yeah. they are. Um, I mean, just to answer that uh, more specifically, um, our emergency uh, service, our emergency planners are working with the fire service specifically on how we prepare, and they've done this last winter, but I think we get better at it each year, is how we prepare for winter, so that the um, fire service who will be in people's homes and know the various communities much better than we do, can work with our emergency planners to ensure that we identify the most vulnerable, that they're getting their flu vaccination, that um, we're connecting locally with the, the communities and that the fire service facilities can be used as well, um, not just during winter but all year round because they're not as busy, uh, at, at least not until this summer, they weren't as busy as they used to be and their facilities are very good and actually are are very popular in local communities. So both in specifically preparing for winter working together with us, the GLA, the Forest Service, and more broadly in making their facilities available, we can offer our bit in as well. Um, and the general practitioners are, are enthusiastic, but I would say it's probably partial knowledge on this. So some have done a lot on it, particularly in showman's area. Um, and we've worked, we've certainly understood what uh, districts outside of London have been doing, but I wouldn't say it's universally understood across London. For years we've been trying to encourage GPs to prescribe bicycles. Um, I don't know how many were prescribed. <laughs> prescribed. <laughs> Did you ever prescribe a bike? No, I didn't. No, I not didn't, didn't know I could. Um, as, a, as, a, as an example of, yeah. of you know, encouraging people to take their health seriously, and of course the Mayor's encouraging people to more embrace their own uh, health and uh, look after their own interests. Um, has the right amount of um, emphasis been placed in the strategy about uh, uh, looking after one's own health, uh, to managing your own health? I mean, we've seen marvelous examples, for example, in the management of diabetes, how self-management self has produced uh, very, very good outcomes. Um, how can we move forward on that and does the health strategy have enough in that? Well, I think going back a little bit, when we last had a big conversation with Londoners some years ago, we do know that people have, you know, they have an ambition to look after themselves. Um, and uh, what, they're, what we are wanting to understand is where is the value we're adding in that personal approach and personal health care. And a lot of that we will understand through conversations uh, with, uh, you know, local government who are much closer, but also through general practice, you know, where we get quite a lot of good advice about where it is that people are struggling or they're just finding the system doesn't work in their favour. Um, and if we, if we, for instance, set out to uh, develop healthy streets, you know, how, what do people beyond that need to actually use that in a way that they feel confident about? Is there something else that is stopping them from doing that? letting their children play on the streets and so on. So I think this really is a partnership. When the inequalities dimension comes into this, I think then it becomes a bit more difficult because if you are depending on people who are really struggling to get from one end of the day to the other to, under, to undertake um, quite a lot of um, responsibility where the burdens are quite heavy, where actually the barriers are quite high, for instance, they're going to a school where the air quality is poor, where they're absolutely surrounded by fast food outlets every kind of couple of yards of the way. Um, that's quite unreasonable. You know, they're already in a difficult situation and the environment they're living in is not conducive. And I think there we have much more to add. So I, I do think this personal responsibility is very important. We know people are ambitious for it. Um, and you know we need to work with them to find out how we can help to make that easier. Is there a role for the mayor to build up to help support the networks that there are? For instance, people who may suffer from uh, sickle cell anemia, um, 
deaf people to, to try and get them to communicate this sort of peer support that's very important if you sometimes want to take control over your own particular issues with health. Is, the, is there a role from the mayor in building up those networks? Well, we know this particular mayor is very grounded and actually um, really um, rejoices in, under, um, in knowing these groups on the ground. And that's very difficult to do at a regional level. I think we're much, uh, we're much on much sounder ground when we get very close and local to where these groups are. And as Imelda says, they're already doing quite a lot of stuff we don't know about. And our, our question there is, you know, do they need anything? And what more could we do reasonably to mitigate the, some of the barriers they're experiencing? So absolutely, I think it's essential that during this consultation, we try and find as much of this as possible and, and provide the right messaging, that we're there actually not just to land more burden on them, but to work with them. And what reasonably can we do together? Dr. Banerjee, do you think the boroughs need to do perhaps more in terms of building these networks up of, of, uh, of peers? Yeah, um, I mean, I think those are, those are really essential. Um, uh, and I think, once again, that comes to really localised work. I mean, if you take, for instance, um, I mean, there's a piece of work that we did in Tower Hamilton in an estate in bringing people together around the issue of diabetes. So, you know, if you're in a, an estate, there will be people who have diabetes who are managing their condition who would benefit from uh, working, you know, contacting other people in their neighbourhoods um, around their condition, supporting each other. Um, and that can happen um, if you have some active work going on around trying to build up um, community engagement um, and bringing people together. And these things can develop spontaneously and can be, and actually quite sustainable. So actually some of the lessons from um, the Well London programme um, over the past few years, that there's numerous examples of how that's happened with really um, just a little bit of um, local uh, facilitation to bring people together. So once again, you can do a little bit, you can bring people together if they enjoy being together and if they get benefits from that, that, that is sustainable for not a lot of resource. So I think that is one, one area that you know, we really want to be looking at. Thank you. Um, um, Ms. Ms. Carr, um, the, the Mayor made, has, well, you've given a commitment to tackling the stigma involved in some infectious diseases, particularly related to HIV and, and TB. Uh, in, um, what would you be doing, what would the team be doing in the next year to achieve that aim of uh, attacking that? the stigma? Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, we have actually set out within the health and quality strategy um, some, of the, um, uh, some of the actions with respect to, uh, to HIV. Um, uh, as part of his leadership in terms of the London Health Board, we have been in conversations with local government about uh, fast track cities um, and about London signing up to that um, particular pledge. Um, and we hope that those, some of those conversations come to fruition um, in, 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 in the next couple of months. Um, and we believe that that type of coalition um, will be um, a really clear example of how local authorities will come alongside the mayor um, and actually deliver some real progress in, in, in areas of, you know, um, in terms of tackling HIV um, and, in, and, and indeed stigma as well. Um, Has so the mayor got a position currently on the uh, prescription of, um, of free prescription of uh, prep, prep treatment. I'm not aware that he does at the moment. I, um, if that's something you, you want to, to specifically ask them, then um, I'm quite happy to come back to the committee on that one. Because it, it sort of it, it danced around the issue in the strategy. Yeah. Yes, I mean, it might be probably worthwhile um, just explaining where we are on this at the moment. So there is a trial. Uh, a national trial which is being led by Public Health England and the NHS and London has a um, that will look at uh, 10,000 um, uh, places to join the trial to actually understand a number of the issues about PrEP that we don't fully understand for instance you know when when do you, how long does PrEP 
last, when do you, you know, how, is this, um, uh, which groups benefit most within the at-risk uh, community? How do you actually monitor this and so on? So there's a number of questions. That's what the trial is looking at. Um, and just at the moment, uh, we're agreeing with uh, local government and with the clinics um, how uh, people are entered into that trial. And that will be for two years. I think it's very welcome. It will go some way to us progressing what is undoubtedly a major development, uh, but needs to be managed into the system because it will also reflect a cost pressure in due course. Mm. But I think we'll understand that much more as we manage it in. Uh, and that's being handled. It's not a mayoral responsibility, but we're very close to it, obviously, because of his ambitions around HIV. Um, so uh, it's being managed to, uh, and in London, we'll have a substantial portion of those places because 40% of the cases are in London. Are you saying that the, because there is uh, press at the moment indicating that PrEP has been amazingly successful, uh, is that just press hyperbole or is there some basis for uh, saying that PrEP actually is doing the job it's intended to do? Well, if we read the evidence from the literature, PrEP is a very powerful, um, it's a very powerful preventive uh, drug and will actually make an impact on, on the HIV epidemic. I mean, we, we definitely agree that on the evidence. The question is how it should be entered into this country uh, through the NHS and how it will be managed and how it will be funded as well. Um, so uh, I don't think it's hyperbole and actually where it has been bought privately, uh, we think this is going on online, that we know it is, it seems to have made, we're not absolutely clear this is the reason why there's been a drop, but it seems to have made an impact. The other reason we think there has been a drop in the incidence of new cases is that people are getting much more, um, much earlier diagnosis, so much earlier um, engagement with the preventive services. Uh, so we are, people are engaging and the instance will be affected by the fact that they are getting much more active preventive advice. Uh, so this is all very positive. We found from the evidence in New York that this package goes together, the engagement with prevention rather than just the fact that it's a pill that will sort every ill. Yeah, I, I understand the residents, but it would be good if the mayor were able to, as soon as possible, come forward with a view on that. I mean, even just from an accountant's point of view, the cost of PrEP compared to the cost of combination therapy for life is, is uh, persuasive enough, I think. Um, with regard to um, TB, uh, how can we, the success of the mayor's strategy be measured? I mean, and is there a target? Because the mayor doesn't like targets. Well, we have a target for TB. Oh, it wasn't wow. popular. Must be the only one. <laughs> um, it was. It wasn't the mayor's target. It was. It preceded this mayor. Um, oh, it was right. jointly oh, agreed no. between ourselves in London and the NHS. Um, it wasn't at the time. It's an interesting experience that uh, when we were talking about zero suicides, uh, people did not think that we could actually achieve a 50% reduction in the instance of let's would be new cases of TB. But we did push for that, and um, we felt that if people pulled together on it, uh, we could do it. Um, it isn't entirely due to all our efforts. There were other factors played in, but it was substantially um, helped by the coordinated clinical and public health actions. And we're going to, I believe, we are very close to meeting that target, so you know, we're very pleased with that. Um, the reason that would differ from, say, something like childhood obesity, where I wouldn't shy away personally from having an ambition, if not a target, is that it's, much, it's a much simpler target to meet because it is infections are just easier to deal with, even although there now is a s substantial social overlay to TB in London when we have dealt with the, the easier elements of it. Uh, obesity has been very, very re resistant to improvement, despite huge amounts of effort. But personally, I don't think that should stop people from having the ambitions. Um, you know, again, there, there is a target. It's not the mayor's target. Um, how will, you're, 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 you're going to monitor it, 
and you're going to, can we have a, are we going to have a, an annual refresh on how it's doing? Or? Yes, we, we are and we do okay. actually. Uh, and what we want to do, the reason this is really an important time is about inequalities. As we begin to reduce, um, you know, the, the uh, elements of uh, the TV instance that were probably just, just a, something that's like poor follow-up or just loss of, um, you know, not cohorting adequately and so on, uh, we're now getting to a group who are very vulnerable there, uh, and that is going to challenge us. So we do need to monitor that. By the way, we, we are actually going to uh, put some targets on uh, our ambitions around HIV as well, the 1990-90. Uh, will be the right thing to do, actually, and we sh we'll be measuring that too. Well, yeah. Would, yeah, they're dropping now anyway, so I suppose now is the time to get targeted, isn't it? Public health always likes to see a declining <laughs> trend. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great. I want to talk about, about healthy habits, right? And particularly two things I want to talk about. There's two strategies, childhood obesity and reduction in smoking, alcohol, and substance um, misuse. The mayor said in the draft strategy that uh, he wants to show leadership on this issue by convening and leading London-wide action to reduce child obesity. Well, how is he going to show his leadership? What is he going to do about this? Um, within the strategy, we do talk about, um, about him, him actually demonstrating that leadership. Um, our, um, our discussion at the moment across, across the wider system um, um, is actually about establishing um, a task force um, and actually um, uh, starting to actually map out um, who in the city is actually um, uh, working in this area, um, uh, specifically in, term, in, in, in terms of the regional value add. Um, we're thinking about um, what sort of um, best practice repository should we have here within the city um, what is the, is the relationship between that repository um, and uh, all the academic um, evidence that we have, um, and also actually to start to build up that body of evidence, um, working internationally as well as um, um, with other uh, sort of global um, metropolitan cities. Um, it's it's a really difficult problem to actually solve. We recognise that um, it's, it requires um, a whole system approach if, if we're going to be able to see uh, these two rates uh, decline o over time. Um, we really recognise that local authorities have, have a very strong role to play in that um, um, in terms of, um, of, of actually tackling um, childhood obesity. Um, but we recognise that there are other bodies in terms of like schools um, and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and that we do need to actually bring a, a system-wide um, uh, approach um, to tackle Amanda, that. is there anything specific which I can hook things onto? Uh, our thinking at the, at the, at the moment uh, will be informed by um, what we hear during, uh, during the consultation. Um, um, and I think at, at this stage, um, it wouldn't be wise for us to be able to say categorically what it is we will be doing. Um, okay. Um, I think in the, in the, in the spirit of, of, of listening to this consultation, um, we want to make sure that um, we actually you know, um, uh, stimulate um, partners to, to actually collaborate and so work with us on it. Do, do you think that the mayor will be making representations to the food and drinks industry uh, of the part they can play in the obesity strategy? Do you think the mayor will pick the phone up to them? Well, as I think, um, as Yvonne said, um, you know, it, it's really it, it's really difficult to um, to ask you know, sort of parents and actually Londoners um, to um, you know uh, look at uh, at their own weight and, and and the weight of their children if we don't actually tackle the the, the obesogenic uh, environment that we live in here in London. Um, so I think you'll see some encouraging um, actions within the London plan and um, in relation to kind of fast food um, outlets. Um, we've also um, done quite a lot of work within um, our devolution work um, here within the city um, and we would hope to make some announcements on, on devolution in the next couple of weeks um, and there are specific actions in there around, um, around um, public health um, and specifically in and around obesity as well. Yes. Um, so Chair, I think um, you know, people sort of get a bit disheartened about obesity but what we've 
become quite good at in the last few years is getting focused on what we're actually trying to do here. And it is the focus is on young children, particularly as part of this being school ready. It's a good measure of school readiness and also of inequalities and of giving every child the best start. So um, that's the territory we're in, not trying to solve everybody's obesity everywhere. This is, it's very important. If we make progress here, we really have begun to get under this problem. Um, the indicators are that it's stabilizing in that group. And it's an interesting point that we think it's stabilizing probably in the more affluent parts of London because mm. this is a partnership with parents. It, par excellence, we cannot do this by imposing uh, to uh, people. It is, it's a parental issue and they need quite a lot of support. The second focus is food. I think food is the important thing. It's very important that children have exercise and it's good for them and it'll help, but in itself it will not work off the amount of food that's going into mm. even children. So um, the nature of the food, the environment um, and, and the portions and the content of food is really important. That's where we can help. And it is a national and citywide endeavour. And I think the mayor will have a significant role in that and has been willing to, to do that. Um, and I think as Manda says, we will be seeing some structural improvements in that over the period of this mayoralty. Yes, I mean, given the weight of evidence available to us. Is there any stopping the, the mayor putting in the London plan that fast food shouldn't be so near schools? Or can he, can he have imp um, impact on, on these uh, fast food shops around schools through the London plan, for example? Well, um, those type of measures um, um, are exactly the type of things that we are looking at in, 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 in terms of childhood obesity and the London plan. I know you're investigating, but is there anything stopping from doing it? Um, in terms of actually... Um, in, 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 in terms of in the London plan saying that we won't have fast food shops near schools? Uh, um, there's actually nothing that would stop him um, him doing it. Um, I think what um, what we as the health team are, are doing is actually creating the body of evidence to be able to actually make the case to ensure those type of recommendations come through the London plan. Um, I think the London plan provides a framework for local authorities to actually be able to implement measures like that. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it is really important that we have um, a very solid body of evidence and, and support from, from local authorities to um, in order for us to be able to put um, very clear measures like that within the London plan. First of all, is there strong evidence about this fast foods and, and, um, and obesity in childhood being near, near schools? I mean, what evidence are they waiting for, yeah. which is not there already in the public domain, is what I'm really driving at. Yes. So there is, there is evidence. It's, it's not cause and effect. This is the problem always with um, in these big complex conditions. There is some evidence um, of uh, what children do and what they do when they leave school. This is not just in the journals, although it has been mapped in journals and then modelled as to what impact that might have on the way they behave and the kind of weights. And they've mapped weight over places and so on and mapped people's routes home. But there's some much more interesting qualitative work where they've actually talked to young people about you know, what they do when they come out of school and why mm. Mm. they go into these places. And it's not always because they're hungry, although it can be. It's, it's very often much more. It's very cheap and it's social and their friends are doing it. It's probably in the past the reason why children smoked. Uh, and now you know, the fast food outlet has become the kind of place to congregate. And the, the sheer amount of calories that they do while they're just snuffling stuff like that really wipes out their, their daily, anything they can work off daily. So this is sort of complex social interaction. It's not simply just you know, a food um, and a hunger issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why it's so important to have a well-informed food strategy that actually works both with business, with what can be done without having to use plans and guidance and laws, but then, you know, what can you do here in London already that the law, the um, guidance will allow you to do 
And when do you reach the limit of that? And that's the very area that we're in in terms of the devolution discussions. You know, what can we reasonably do here? And local government has form on this. I mean, we are, we're learning a lot about what, what the ambition is there and what has been learned. So I think, you know, this is a journey. Sorry, just, just to build on Don't. what Yvonne was saying, um, I, I, th I think that um, actually that we, we did some videos with, with, with young people in, in Tower Hamlets and it, it really resonates with what Yvonne was saying. Was actually, it's about having a place to go um, after school and, and having those sorts of places available. It's not so much fast food, it's actually the social elements, although the, social, the, the fast food itself is actually physiologically addictive. Um, but in actual fact, it's, the, it's those social elements. So actually, in the, most, the areas of greatest deprivation, one way of addressing this fast food issue is actually making sure that young people have, have places to go where they can like, enjoy themselves after school in, in, in a way that's healthy. The, the issue about um, you know, not opening fast foods near schools, I think is helpful, but actually when, when you look at a place like Tower Hamlets, there's about, there's about 44 fast food outlets near secondary schools, so you can't necessarily close fast food um, outlets. You may be able to do something to you know, stop a new one opening up, um, which would be helpful because actually what, what you often find is there's retail space and you get another fast food outlet where you could have had a, a kind of more healthy offer locally. So I think it's quite a complex issue, but I think it is just about having places for kids to go after school where they can enjoy themselves in a healthy way and that's a, that's a big challenge in areas of deprivation. So I'm looking at, 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 at say, at any given borough, right, okay, or, or, or the incidents between Boris, what can we do um, to reduce childhood obesity which have the most impact? And what should the target be that we should be trying to pursue? I th I what, what can we do at borough level which have the most impact? So, going back to what Yvonne was saying, I think the early years are really important because that's actually where we have some leverage mm -hmm. um, because we have the health visiting services, mm -hmm. we have um, um, children's centres and act so because clearly um, you know something's happening between the ages of naught to five in which the outcome is that children in more deprived areas mm -hmm. have higher levels of obesity and it comes down to some I think some really sort of quite micro things that you do at an individual level so obviously breastfeeding is one thing that's really important but it's that process of weaning um, actually um, parents getting really good advice but also skills around um, supporting healthy eating it also comes down to income mm -hmm. um, so it's a combination of all those things that and actually one bit is fizzy drinks um, you know sugar rich drinks which are way too many calories for you know a two-year-old mm -hmm. which are kind of driving both too many calories but also tastes and and habits in later life so so from my perspective, yes, there's some really big sort of environmental issues like fast food outlets, the physical environment, but where, where, where we would really want to influence um, at a very local level are things like health visiting, integration of services, making sure parents have the advice that they need. And actually there's one thing I think which is in the mayor's strategy, which is about accreditation of early years, healthy early years, which I think is a kind of extension of the healthy schools program, but bringing it to bringing it um, to, to early life. And I think that could be something that could be really helpful in this context. Great, okay. Um, and just, just to, uh, to teach our doctor, God bless, what action could be taken through the strategy to support people who are already misusing alcohol, tobacco, and other substances, as well as uh, preventing people from taking these, hab these uh, bad habits? Uh, I think there are some uh, interventions around uh, community support and in many cases again it, it's, it's a, a more advanced form of the fact of, of who they congregate with where they congregate and providing healthier alternatives as well as support services for people who um, are 
are using drugs or alcohol or, uh, and, the, and smoking, with all of these things which are essentially addictive. Um, again, what the evidence is, is that when you have, say, a smoking cessation program, where you have deprived individuals, it takes more um, repetitions of, this, of the smoking cessation to achieve success. People who are in deprived circumstances are just as keen to take part in smoking cessation. It's their failure rate that is higher. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of drug treatment programs. You, you just need a number of repeat efforts of that same program, and that means it is more expensive to run a cessation program in a, among poorer people, among more deprived individuals. Uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, um, do you think that this strategy is ambitious enough in what, what, what it proposes? Well, I think you, you can always be more ambitious, but I think there are specific details which I think, as Yvonne was saying earlier, need to be fleshed out in, in the programme, both through the consultations with the public and with um, non-governmental organisations, but also with expert groups on what are effective, what each group thinks are effective strategies and by triangulating yes. the information that's coming from those different sources to then come up with more specific actions that, that would um, address these issues because some of the evidence is quite strong on, on what is effective in reducing um, inequalities in, yeah. in behaviours. Thank you. Dr. Brindley? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add uh, just, just some thoughts on um, illegal tobacco, availability yes. of illegal tobacco um, across London, because I think that's quite a significant um, inequalities issue. Um, because, and actually, it's, 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 it's also something that is related to young people taking up habits around smoking, because we know that um, for that age group, they're quite sensitive to price. So if you're growing up in an area of, of high deprivation with easy access to cheap tobacco, that is, A, going to make it easier for you to take up smoking, but also um, harder to give up. And so I think that's actually quite a significant um, health inequalities issue because <coughs> from, from, from the work that, that we've been doing, it is a widespread issue um, in the most deprived areas. It's not a small issue. It's very easy to get um, low-priced um, illegal tobacco. And so I think it's, hard, it's a challenging issue to address. I think there is more that could potentially be done at London level to kind of bring together intelligence and um, communications around the issue of illegal tobacco. Because, I, I, it, you know, because it's going to have a significant impact on young people's health as well because they're the most susceptible to it. So. Thank you. Um, yes? Um, in, in terms of your question about is it ambitious enough, um, if we were starting from scratch and, had, and could then also build powers to, um, to make things happen, then, then you would be able to write a, a, a much more ambitious, uh, you know, uh, with targets. But when you look at where we're at, which is that health is delivered very locally, um, uh, local authorities across 33 local authority areas, and um, and that that London not having that that over overarching strategic approach to health, I think it is ambitious for where we're at and with the powers that that are available and the levers that are available. So I like the realistic bit of it because it would be very easy to write, you know, motherhood and apple pie stuff. But if you haven't got the levers or the powers, you'll never make it happen. So. We, we, we're going to touch on levers and powers later, later on. Right, OK. <laughs> we are, we, we'll be touching that later on. But, um, okay. but uh, well, thank you for that. I just want to uh, talk to Yvonne, uh, Yvonne and, and Amanda. How is the mayor engaging with the... STP leads to ensure proper access to services are in place right, right across London to deliver the strategy? Um, so at the moment, um, uh, uh, um, the Mayor chairs the London Health, um, uh, 
Health Board. Um, this indeed has oversight of another body called the Strategic Partnership Board um, and the, um, the lead uh, local authority provider um, and CCGs are all represented on that board. Great. Yvonne? Yes, and through our wider networks, uh, we're very much involved with the preventive end of the STPs, um, both nationally and in London. And we work very closely with the um, Association of Directors of Public Health uh, as a core group, so that we're pr pressing the reality of getting prevention in and indeed implemented in the STPs. Okay, great, uh, thank you. Uh, and to uh, how will proposed devolution of health powers to the mayor help to support the delivery of this strategy? Would you, I mean, uh, can you explain that to us, please? Um, um, so, um, over the last um, eight, um, 18 months, we've been working collectively across a partnership. Um, that's a partnership with the, with the health commissioners, with Public Health England, with the NHS, um, with, with uh, l l local authorities and, and London councils. Um, to be able to seek um, greater devolution to London, so that indeed we can actually make some of the decisions about London in London. Um, there are some very um, uh, key things within that devolution um, agreement, and we're hoping to get um, that signed um, with, um, with national government um, in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, there are a lot of key enablers that we need to, um, to be able to... Uh, um, address within the city um, and when you talk about health inequalities clearly some of the underlying uh, determinants of health such as um, housing um, will be covered um, by some of the devolution asks that we're that we're seeking in relation to estates um, in terms of actually how we use um, uh, some of the surplus land within uh, the health uh, service um, for the provision of, of affordable housing um, uh, there are also some um, aspects of devolution in, in terms of actually um, of uh, how transformation funding is used by the STPs, um, for example, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it, um, it's it, it's quite a, a broad um, uh, ranging uh, uh, array of powers that we will be seeking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it is a, a partnership request um, of the city, um, and those type of powers will enable the STPs. To be able to um, to be able to deliver the type of changes we need to support uh, the reduction in health inequalities. Okay, um, and just to, to sort of the mayor's manifesto promised a comprehensive public health strategy to London. That's what the mayor promised to the mayor. Is this strategy, which you've, he's put forward, a fulfilment of that manifesto pledge? Um, well, I would say because the aims that we have outlined within this strategy, which have been um, uh, consulted um, on prior to even um, uh, uh, launching this wider public consultation, um, actually include some of the, the major areas that, um, that partners feel that the GLA should be addressing. Uh, so I would say that this is, is the basis for a public health strategy. Um, and of course, um, we uh, work with Public Health England um, on that, and um, and their involvement in terms of the of, of the indicators and the evidence that we need um, to be able to exercise that is really key and important. I mean, it's certainly a substantial part of it. I think the mayor probably would say over a period of time it may not reflect the whole the totality of his ambition. Uh, for public health, but I think you know if we deliver this, we have delivered a, a substantial part of his manifesto on health. Dr. Goldblatt, do you think this strategy meets the criteria of being a comprehensive public health strategy? Well, <clears throat> I go back to what I was saying at the beginning. I think within the document, it covers all the bases. I think there are gaps in terms of some of the aims and objectives um, that some are perhaps focused more downstream and there are gaps in what can be done upstream. I and mean, we've talked about some of those things as being part and parcel of it. And I think it would all, to be comprehensive, it also needs to link across between the objectives, between the different areas of action so that it, it's, connect, it's a connected strategy, it's a coherent strategy. So I think it has the potential to be that. I think through the consultation and through um, the, the process of drafting the final document, 
it can achieve that. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And just to sort of final up in this section, right, is uh, if, if all of you can answer it, I'll, I'll pick you <laughs> turn by turn, right, is what do you view are the most significant risks, right, to deliver the strategy? What do you think are the risks that we won't achieve what, what's ever promised here? So perhaps we can start with you, with you Dr. Benin. Um, so, so I think, as I said right from the beginning, I think that this, this is, strategy is a great opportunity to align what we're doing locally um, with, what, with what's going on at London level. Um, so, so, the, so the risk is, is, is lack of engagement. So if it doesn't, if we don't get that connection right and if we don't get that dialogue right, then it's likely to be a strategy that doesn't have the impact that, that we would want it to have. So, so I think these next few months are, are really critical to, to get things right, getting engagement of the health and wellbeing boards, um, to get that re and, and to use the health and wellbeing boards to get that really local engagement um, with the questions. And actually, some of the questions are quite challenging when you look at them. Actually, what more can we do? And I think getting those insights from people and actually recognizing, in my view, that people actually really want to be involved in this um, if they're engaged in the right way. And people in the most deprived boroughs actually particularly so because they may not necessarily have had the voice that, 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 they, that they feel that they should have. So to me that's, that's what it's all about now is actually getting that consultation right and having some real dialogue and that's, that's the biggest risk of that not happening will kind of make, kind of mean that the strategy doesn't have the impact because as Amanda says it's actually, it's not all about, the London Mayor can't do all of this. It ha we have to do this together across London. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, not to repeat that, I agree with that. Um, it was well received when it was launched at the end of August. Um, but I think what we want in this is we want to leverage some of the wider assets of London as well. It's terribly important at this time that we are not looking upwards to national government, that we actually... Um, engage all of London in something that is a, a London challenge and my risk would be that we don't get those assets it's left to a smallish number of people to, mm. to sort this it won't it won't succeed unless we actually get a, a very wide engagement with this so we will be working hard to ensure that. Amanda? Um, we're not wanting to repeat anything that uh, that either um, either one and uh, Shilman have said. Um, I think what's really going to be key is actually for Londoners um, to be really engaged um, with that. Um, we have some mechanisms within the consultation to be able to to gauge that. So clearly, we have conversations going on um, across Talk London. We have a survey with Londoners as well. So it'll be really key for us to be able to hear from Londoners um, what their expectations are. Um, and also for us to understand um, what type of behaviours we, we can, you know, we will see from Londoners, um, and actually to be able to measure the uh, the extent of the challenge that uh, we have ahead in terms of actually really engaging communities, um, really um, working with the voluntary sector to make sure that those least heard voices um, uh, can be heard, um, and also so that we can really have that sort of um, um, sort of co-responsibility with the citizen to be able to actually. Um, um, to, uh, to really support and enable those who are most vulnerable to be able to actually um, uh, uh, improve their own health, but also for us um, as a public sector to support that. Um, so, you know, really, you know, really key is um, is that engagement with um, the voluntary and uh, and civil society as well as communities. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, <coughs> I think just to, to embellish what's been said is to make Londoners feel empowered to um, address the issues and uh, empower the, the communities in which they live. And secondly, to, align, as I've said earlier, align the strategy and the goals with other sectors so that um, it's one coherent strategy of which reducing health inequalities is an integral part rather than a, an add-on. Great. Thank you. And uh, Melba? Uh, for me, I think the, um, the biggest risk is that the community engagement part of the, um, the, the buy-in isn't resourced properly. 
and, um, and falls apart because it, because it costs money and time to get groups organised and get to places and to bring in people who are the most excluded and, and it's, very, it's very culturally different to work with people in their communities than it is to work with um, professionals. So it's really understanding how you do that and having the resource <coughs> to do that well I think is really important. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, this part comes to, we, we, it's, it could, it's a, we, we're going to stop the, the, the examination of the strategy at this stage, okay? So thank you very much for your contributions. If you think of something you think we've forgotten to ask you or you want to make a contribution afterwards, um, then you please feel, feel free to write to us. We're still open to suggestions because we, I don't think we have to give a, when's the deadline for giving? Um, um, 13, 13th October. So the consultation will, will be um, open until, uh, until the 30th of November. So the 30th of November, sorry. Yeah, yes. yeah, okay. yeah. So, so if you have time, if you want to say that you, you, we've forgotten something to ask you, you want to make input, please let us have that information. I want to spend a little bit more time with Amanda and Professor, Professor Dole to, to look at the STP, uh, which was launched this morning by the King's Fund. Right? Okay. So the other guests are welcome to stay if you wish to. If you wish to go, um, we're, we're, we're happy to release you. Um, so, but we want to spend a bit more time to uh, consider the report that was launched this morning by the King's Fund, which was commissioned by the Mayor on, on the STPs. Okay. So, um, so, Amanda, could you please summarise uh, your analysis of the report which we have we had from the King's Fund? And, and also the Nuffield, and what do you think the, uh, the main findings are? Um, so, um, the King's Fund report that was commissioned uh, by the Mayor um, uh, sought to, um, uh, to, to um, have an independent um, analysis um, on, on the plans that were uh, uh, submitted um, by the NHS. Um, there's much to commend. It, within those plans. Um, uh, we can see clear evidence of prevention. We can see um, uh, evidence of, um, of, uh, of addressing health, health inequalities. Um, but uh, uh, as, as Tom Coffey this morning said, there are some aspects of those plans where we have some concerns, uh, uh, especially around uh, some of the assumptions to do with uh, reconfiguration and uh, bed numbers, um, and also uh, with respect to some of the financial assumptions of, of, of those plans. Um, uh, and that's the, uh, the dialogue that we will um, hope to have with the STP leads over the next um, uh, coming months and years. Thank you. Um, Professor Doyle, did you have any comments to make on the... Yes, I, th I mean, Chair, I thought it was, um, it was an interesting discussion this morning. Um, mm. Clearly what was being said there was the NHS is under a huge amount of pressure. Um, uh, and I think it was I interesting to hear the perspective of the medical director who was feeling that some of the work that was being done was actually having an impact on the pressure on the NHS, whereas perhaps less confidence among the commentators, particularly those working in uh, the system and the worry about workforce and morale. From our point of view, I think um, it was acknowledged that the, the STPs had a very strong prevention element in them and the whole issue and it will be the issue actually is so what happens now how does that make an impact on population health um, in a system that's very stressed and uh, the report is I think does acknowledge that it can that just depending on the NHS to get prevention to work won't work at all it has to come at least through integrated approaches in the place and preferably to some of the approaches we've been discussing here. So I think if we, if what the STPs have put, and I've had to assess them myself over various times, what they have put in for prevention is very close to some of the issues we've identified because they're the, the problems that people are perceiving about London. It's very important that we uh, work through the London Prevention Board to enable those STPs to keep the transformation element in sight and that we do have um, a way of supporting them to deliver what their ambitions are. And that's what the Prevention Board will be doing. I'll be chairing that. Mm -hmm. 
it'll have two purposes. It'll look at that and it'll look at the implementation of the health inequalities strategy itself. It'll have a delivery plan purpose. And the, the more we can align that, the better. Because yes. I think what this is saying is it's a system under pressure. Okay. Uh, Amanda, in terms of the findings of this report from the King's Fund, which the Mayor has commissioned, how does the Mayor intend to take this forward? Um, okay, so um, uh, so at the launch this morning, um, uh, Tom Coffey actually took the um, uh, the audience through um, a series of six assurances that the Mayor will be seeking um, in order to, for him to be able to give political support uh, to the implementation of these plans. Um, and the, the, the assurances um, uh, relate, uh, as I say, to six areas. Um, firstly, to, to public and patient engagement. Um, he wants to see very clear evidence that, uh, um, that, uh, that local people and, and, and indeed Londoners um, have been consulted um, and understand uh, the plans and the rationale for, those, for the changes. Um, he also wants assurances that there is clinical engagement, um, that there is um, a clear evidence that the plans actually will uh, look to improve this, um, the health outcomes um, of, uh, of, uh, of Londoners. Um, clearly, um, you know, we've been speaking about health inequalities uh, today, and, um, and we'll, we will want assurances that, uh, that any of these plans will, won't um, uh, increase um, health inequality over the city, and indeed, uh, we'll be looking for evidence to make sure that they reduce um, health inequalities. Um, other areas, as everyone has alluded to, is just in terms of prevention. Um, we recognise that the system is is um, is, is stressed, and uh, a, a clear aim is actually mm -hmm. to keep Londoners um, healthier for longer, and uh, um, and actually um, uh, try where possible to actually reduce the demand for healthcare services across the city. Um, he also um, uh, outlined um, uh, assurances that we all, that we will be seeking in terms of um, of, of bed numbers and. Uh, and 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 uh, and real clear evidence of the analysis behind the um, uh, any reconfiguration um, changes proposed. Uh, Tom made reference to um, the, six, the three tests that uh, Simon Stevens um, has outlined himself, um, and we'll be looking for you know uh, very pragmatic assurances that uh, those tests um, have been taken on, on board. Um, and then finally, clearly, the, 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 the finances. Um, uh, Nigel Edward outlined the, the funding challenge for London. It's a um, you know, 4.1 billion funding gap. Um, and, uh, uh, and clearly, um, he, the mayor will be looking for assurances from government that, uh, that there is that and will be adequate investment um, within London um, to be able to implement these plans. So, Dr. Tom Coffey will be leading the work in this area. So he'll be taking forward this report uh, and the impact it has on across London and looking at examining each STP as those changes are brought forward on behalf of the mayor, yeah? Yeah, so, so I, believe, right? yeah I mean, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, those assurances are, are, are very comprehensive. Um, you know, they do cover health inequality and prevention, so you know, he will be working collaboratively with uh, Professor Doyle um, you know, to, uh, to ensure that um, we get the assurances that uh, the mayor will require. Did you have any questions? What mayor, does the, sorry, what is the mayor envisaging his role will be? Um, uh, the mayor um, this morning, um, when he accepted the report from uh, um, the King's Fund, uh, was um, was really stressing um, his role with respect to, to leadership. Um, he was um, he um, was making a, you know a, a call to government to say that um, uh, that we need to address some of the fragmentation of the um, uh, of the of the changes implemented in the Health and Social Care Act. Um, and he sees his role clearly as um, as being able to galvanise all those partners um, to to ensure that we actually actively improve um, health and care services across the city through this um, planning process um, and, uh, and and that we do take on board um, the public with us um, as, uh, as we as those plans are implemented so is it to, to lead or to convene um, I think it's I, I think it's both um, I think it's 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 um, it's convening in terms of his, his role within the London Health Board but it's also you know speaking out on behalf of Londoners 
There is a slight difference between those two. I think it's both. When you convene a group of people, you don't necessarily think that they're going to agree. You don't necessarily assume they're going to agree with what you want to do. Uh, whereas leadership entails you're going to you're going to do what the mayor's going to do what he wants to do. Um, convening means you're going to take on board what everybody else says they want to do. Um, but so you're. I find it. I find it difficult to understand how you can do exactly both. Um, um, you can convene and give leadership. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's difficult for me to speak on, on behalf yes. of the mayor. Um, uh, but I think there is um, a real sense of collaboration um, when it comes to London Health Board and, uh, um, um, and a real sense that actually um, that of that collective ownership in, in, to ensure that... Um, that any changes that we see within um, the health and care system actually are, are jointly owned, and and, um, and that we actually do work collectively as as, as a partnership to um, to be able to deliver the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. for um, Kira, just on a comment on this. So um, this is a problem, I think, for every mayor in London, in that that Londoners think the mayor should have a view on health on the NHS. Uh, and, and probably would think more about that than about public health in the first instance. Uh, and I don't think it's something that any mayor has been able to avoid. And the criteria here for, you know, this, th there needs to be substantial change here if this system is to survive, actually. Um, and no amount of partnership will keep that going as is. It, it will need to transform. And therefore, the mayor needs some way of judging, you know, what his guardianship role is. And I think Londoners expect that. Uh, and we saw that with the previous mayor as well. So the, it's hard to avoid, and it's important that it is as evidence-based as it can be, and that's objective. And the London Health Board is essentially a political board with, a, mm -hmm. you know, advisory, senior advisory input to it. Um, and the partnership board that Amanda describes is, is where the work will and the sort of officer leadership will happen and it needs to do that well to prepare the ground for good transformation. Um, but you know the place we don't want to be in London as we're, we have so many ambitions is for us to fall apart in you know lack of focus and agreement on, based on good evidence in what is undoubtedly <coughs> going to be a very difficult time. I mean, uh, this, uh, when uh, Dr. Coffey res responded to this report this morning, he did talk about also the London Health Board at that stage also. But I'm concerned that London Health Board meets in pri privacy. We aren't sure what the agenda is. We, aren't, we don't know what's been discussed there. We don't see any minutes of it. So do I sense right that there's a move to make this much more public and transparent? Um, the... Uh um, what's discussed um, and, uh, and, and so minutes of the board are actually are, are, are published on, um, on, on London.gov. So the, the agenda's publicised it? Uh, the, the, uh, there is a summary of the meeting, of each of the meetings on, on London.gov. So, so I, I just want to get this absolutely right for my own clear, right? Is the agenda of the health board put in the public domain? At the moment, no. Okay. Is the... Fails, if you might, it fails the very, very simple test that this assembly has been uh, pushing for for years on all sorts of issues, that all these bodies should have their agendas publicised so, and the public, wherever possible, should be allowed to attend and see what's going on. Um, and if we expect in this board to give us leadership, it's a very important area on a report which has been commissioned by the mayor, I think. We need to give. We like, I like to, you, Amanda, give some thought to this matter. Okay, why is it that the agenda is not in the public domain? Why public meetings are held in secrecy? Why we are not able to access? And we've asked this question before. This was, uh, I mean, this was something was established by Mayor Boris. But in the fact that we, the mayor wants more leadership role in this position, I think the thought needs to be given to this matter. Okay, yeah. why yeah. these uh, things are not in the public domain? And we had the same criticisms of him as well. Okay, uh, uh, let me just take that away yes, uh, as, a, uh, thank you know, you. Thank as you. an action. Um, and of course the other thing is that of course we will look at this at King's report, the, the, this report in the, the months to come and we expect Dr. Tom, Tom Coffey to come here as he's leading on this matter. Uh, that, that's, this is something we will expect him to, to attend. 
uh, to, to give his views on, on, on this report and how it's, being, how it's panning out across London. Him or the mayor, either Him or do. the mayor, yes. Uh, okay, so any other questions? Okay. So thank you very much uh, for your contributions uh, this afternoon. And uh, finally, can I ask the committee to agree to the recommendations and the delegate authority to me, a uh, chair, to agree to the output of, of some of the discussions? Yeah? Agreed. Thank you. Um, can I ask members to agree the focus of discussions on the uh, members to see an update on the Mayor's recent activity regarding STV? I think we've done that, haven't we? Um, can I thank all of the contributions this afternoon? And uh, can I also agree that, that we note the work programme for 2017 and 18? Yeah. To agree the meeting of, of slot for the 28th of November to be used to discuss healthy early years activity in London. Okay. Um, and to agree to delegate authority to me as chair to agree the arrangement for any side visits, informal meetings, or engagements, activities before the committee's next formal meeting. Okay. Yeah. And uh, please, can I ask you to note that the next meeting will be on the 28th of November at 10 a.m. in Room 5 City Hall. Okay. And can I ask the committee to, to agree to delegate authority to me as chair to send a letter to the outgoing head of and his London and Rainsbury for years in service and to send a correct letter to the incoming head of and his England, Professor Cummings, on behalf of the committee? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.